All right. Hello, Fortinos, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is August 3rd, 2023, and we have missed it with all the rest of the world again. But I said I'd never leave you. Of course, I'm never going to leave you because remember this. I've said it a number of times. I, I was sharing it in the forum the other day. Uh, I'm always reminded what our brother uh, Roy told me. Uh, uh, sorry, not Roy. Uh, Mark Skidari had said. He said, it doesn't bother me because I know the Lord will make more understanding known. He never leaves us hanging. Why? Because we are diligently seeking him. We are blessed to receive his revelation. And that is truly the greatest gift. It's the revelation of him that continues to draw us closer and get us just understanding him and knowing him better and better and better with every passing day. And so as much as we miss the day, as much as it sucks, as much as I'm going to share with you what I believe is more time remaining, and I'm going to reveal the understanding of it, for which over the last maybe year, year and a half, I've had a variety of these questions in emails or comments asked to me. One is this first seven years that we know of, right? Like it's 777 is the revelation of the end of days. And, and a question posed about it. We're going to touch on that part just briefly. Um, I was also asked by our brother Jake um, in relation to the story of Noah and, and this timing within this understanding of Noah with something that I have taught on for many times over the years that Noah's year represents. And there's so many parts and pieces that, and then I'm also going to share a piece from Jeremiah. Now, when we shared and we did this video in Jeremiah, which is the, the story of the grapes of wrath, that relation to the final year of tribulation, I don't know how many people caught it. When I was studying for it, I, I noticed it, but I, I kind of thought, well, no, it, it's kind of got to be part of it. Well, the reality is it's not a part of it. It's a separate portion after it. And you're going to see what I'm talking about as we get into this. Um, you guys will already know the title of the video by this point. But the video is something along the lines of it's all about zeros and ones. I shared uh, yesterday or the day before in the forum that I would be coming back with a new video. And that uh, a couple of people had asked me the title. I figured some people might get the understanding from the title, but the it's kind of cryptic, right? Because you see zeros and ones. So a lot of people might think, well, it has to do with, um, you know, with what the computer does and, you know, AI and zeros and ones, the ultimate, you know, in the physical sense of a computer and the ultimate processing of zeros and ones. Well, that isn't it. But it's just, it, it's quite fascinating that it's the connection. We had uh, one of our brothers, uh, Keith, in the forum. Anybody who's new and you hear me talking about the forum, you could join. It's free. There's 11, 1,200 people in there. You can go to the website, ministryrevealed.com. Click on the link to the forum. Sign up in five seconds or so. And you can join uh, you know, 11, 1,200 people from around the world sharing uh, prayer requests, Bible studies. Many people have become friends and meet up. I mean, all sorts of things going on. And uh, our brother Keith had shared that it was interesting because I had put that it would be called zeros and ones. And he had said how zero. So first of all, zero and one starts the Fibonacci uh, code, right? This Fibonacci sequence. And zero is also a representation for God. And the sun is representation of one. And so what an ultimate deception by the enemy that computer code is zeros and ones giving us access to everything, everywhere, anytime, all at once, however you want, all from zeros 
and wants. But, I, and I thought that was a really interesting tie-in. However, it wasn't really part of the reason why I did it. The reason why I did it is because you guys will remember with the Shemitah year chart, because right now, every one of you should be saying, well, I thought that Shemitah, that Sabbath year, seven year chart, I thought it was perfect, Alan. Well, so did I. In fact, essentially it is, but when you see it updated, you're going to say, well, no, it's not. There was one difference. One difference in the entirety of the story. And the answer is zero or one. You see what I'm saying? You see how it's pretty incredible in this connection? When you see it, as you understand it, you're going to say, you're, you're, first of all, you're going to say, well, this is crazy. What about this? How does that account for this? Well, when we get to there, how, do, how does this get accounted for that? And what about when we get to the 70 of Jerusalem? How does that get accounted for this? I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. I'm going to walk you through every portion and piece of it. You know, I wanted to share something with you guys as well. First of all, you're going to notice this is a bit of a new format. You can see all my tabs open and, and everything else that you don't normally see. Um, that's because you might even notice my voice might even be a little bit louder or more clear. Um, I didn't get any new technology. I would love it. Do you guys realize that I do my videos with like a $25, $30 uh, earbud with a little mic on it? <laughs> that's what I do them from. But what had happened is, you guys know, uh, we had issues with the last video, which, yes, the last video I did take down, it was wrong. It never came to pass. It wasn't connected. It was wrong. I took it down. All right. That's why it's not there. Um, but uh, this format is because instead of using Screencast-O-Matic, which I'd been using for years, Screencast-O-Matic wasn't allowing an update for some reason. And so it wouldn't let me record in the normal way that I do it. So I went and used the app and it let me do it. But then it wasn't recording the sound from the video clip that I, when I would show video clips. So I thought, oh, man, what the heck is going on? And I couldn't figure it out. And I still can't. So I had the idea last night to use Zoom. So with Zoom, I could still record. I can show videos. It's crystal clear when I show videos. There's no little ups and downs of volumes. Everything works so much better. So I'm using Zoom and I'm just doing a, a download to my laptop. So I'm still going to do as usual. It will download to my laptop and then I'm going to upload when I'm done uh, to YouTube. So that's why you're seeing this uh, this difference in the screen. Um, the other thing I wanted to share was my son. You know, man, I've got some good kids. My son and my daughter. My daughter's just about 18 and my son's 20. And uh, he knows it was a big watch date, right? Let's face it. We're not playing around. We are seeking our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are diligently seeking him. We are seeking him. He is leading us by his spirit in the revelation of his word. And it has been an incredible about six-year journey. Well, my son is aware of this too. He's been living in this house the whole time, right? And um, it, was, it was just really sweet. You know, I teared up talking about it with someone the other day. And um, he, I was in the garage the night before, you know, as we were at this final high watch which actually didn't go even to Saturday. It actually went to the 15th of Av as the final possibility as the Moses one we've shared in, uh, in Exodus 19. So I ended up, I was just, you know, a few hours had passed and, and I was in the garage and I was just in prayer and just in conversation with the Lord. And, you know, Lord, what the heck is going on? What are we missing? You know, that Shemitah year, this count, I mean, come on, what is happening? And, you know, frustrated, but, I know what we've been given. It is the revelation. We haven't missed anything except for when it would begin. And that's the same thing with the whole rest of the world. The rest of the stuff we've been given is the mind-blowing, incredible revelation of the Lord. And so as, you know, the, the night progressed, and I was probably in the garage doing my thing till about midnight. I went in, I showered, got ready. And my son, who was down in the basement, he's got his room down there. I guess while I was showering, he came and put a little sticky note uh, on my laptop. So when I come back down, I'd see it. 
And uh, he just said, I love you, Dad. And I know what you're doing isn't easy, but keep going. You got it. Good night, Ocean. My son's name is Ocean. So it still kind of chokes me up. And then I didn't see him till the following day when he came back from work. And uh, of course, a good uh, father-son hug. And uh, see, it still chokes me up. <laughs> uh, kids. <laughs> sip of coffee there we go so you know it's just it was appreciated and um and i know that all of our brothers and sisters in the ministry they get it right i mean nobody else is right we you know there's good news in that at least you're not left behind you see but we have the blessing guys we have is revelation we have we're, we're watching we're praying we're diligent and he never leaves us hanging and so we're going to go into this not being left hanging that uh, that we're talking about. You're 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 not going to be excited, although you might be excited, because it's exciting to have greater clarity in the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the greatest joy that we have in this ministry, and I harp on it regularly, because yes, the date and trying to watch is so exciting. But when it passes, ah, people crash and burn. What should I do? Should I leave and go do something else? No, you need to get better with, uh, we, we all do. We need to get better with our time management to do the things in life that need doing while we're watching and praying and diligently seeking him. There are people all throughout the ministry that have jobs, right? This is my job. This is what I do for a living. This is this is what I'm called to do. But it's not what everybody's called to do. Right? People have to provide. People need to support. If there wasn't support, I couldn't keep doing what I do. If there wasn't support, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing in in um in uh Uganda with our brother Steve and his team. So, you know, everybody has their part and their purpose and not everybody's is the same. But we must get better at managing the things in our lives that need to get done. That we keep putting aside, expecting the time's going to come. Well, I think you're going to be able to do that better this time around. Many are already really good at it. But there's a lot that aren't and that causes a struggle in their life. All right. Believe me, I know my wife and I, my family, we have a wonderful relationship. But for me, it's the personal things that I would like to get done that I always put off. And I myself also need to get better at those things. So we even had a, a family conversation about that, that with this time that you're going to come to understand, even though we're watching at other things before that, when you understand this time, I believe it will help you better plan out your time knowing you're not always on the edge of your seat. You see, this is also something we discussed many times over the years, that, that in the beginning, when we were just coming into the revelation that started in September 2017, so the ministry started um, officially the first video, the 16th, 17th of June, and then when I knew something changed, was September 8th, 2017, as you guys all know. And from that point forward, as we were growing in the revelation, we were looking at every event because we really didn't have a good groundwork in, in understanding the feast, in understanding the harvests, in understanding the cycles of the sun, the moon, and the stars. All of these things we didn't have the revelation of the open books. We didn't have the beginning of creation. We didn't have every single piece that we do now. It was a continuous, continuous process of diligently seeking and the spirit leading and revealing. That's what's been going on. So what had happened? We were looking at everything like everybody was for a couple of years. By the third year, it tapered down. We were looking to about three or four events in the year. By the following year, we were looking at really a couple of time frames in the year. Then this past year, we got even more clarity 
and we were only looking at two, but this period of time was all based on what went to the count that was in that time frame, either before or after Taurus. That's the entirety of what we look for now. And so what happened in the previous year, there was nothing for us to watchfully expect for a time of, of pre-trib escape from January until June. And what happened? Well, a number of people left, not everybody, but a number of people left and said, I've had enough, I'll see you back at around June. Well, unfortunately for them, you, you end up missing the revelation of Jesus Christ being revealed. And man, did we have some awesome revelation during that one. Remember the, the, the revelation of creation and, and how it revealed the 14 and above years and how it was also a picture of seven. I mean, so many incredible revelations. That's why I can't imagine. I can't even fathom because I couldn't fathom that we had the creation story hidden like that in the revelation of 21 years as 21,000 and then the 22nd being the new beginning and the 22nd thousand being the time of eternity. I, I, it, it, I couldn't even fathom that. So I can't even fathom now what the Lord might have coming for us next. But you see what happened is it got more and more and more detailed and more refined every single month and quarter and year along the way. Well, that's what's happening here now, too. And when you see that this difference was the difference of a zero and one, you'll see the reason for the title. Okay? So let's not be upset. Let's take a deep breath and let's remember that, look, nobody else has gone either. We're all still here. The pre-trib has never hasn't happened yet. The tribulation 100% has not begun yet. Is it screaming all around us? Absolutely, man. I watched some real in-depth videos on these leaders of AI and these talks and conversations that they have about the direction and how it can go. Man, it is insanity. And it's all around us. It's happening. It's like I was telling my wife the last few months. It's everywhere all at once. It's all around us. It's in everything. And this has caused us many times, not just me, but throughout many people in the ministry that we think, well, there's no way it can go X amount more time. Look at everything that's happening. Well, how many times have we said that? Right? What about when the pandemic came? Oh my goodness, this was the sign. The pandemic, there's no way. It's going to go much longer. And we're what, three and a half years? Coming up on three and a half years since it started? How much longer can it go? What we have to understand and what we've been trying to understand is 70. There are two portions of 70, but how on earth, Lord, how on earth are they playing out? Well, I'm going to show you we're now one step closer in the understanding of it. And in the time we have, we're going to continue to diligently seek. We'll add on to the clarity. We'll find more scriptures within it that will lead the revelation of it. We will continue to diligently seek in other parts, drawing closer to him. My next video, God willing, I'm expecting to be uh, 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 founded all in Romans. And how we know Romans is the bride is all about the pre-trib stuff and, and, and this portion above. We're, we're going to discuss that. We're going to break it down. We're going to go through it. But we're also going to connect it to the workers that we know are this portion with the Son of Man for 40 days. And then we'll be here at least during seals and maybe a group saved right to the end. You're going to see uh, if that is the next video, which I do plan on it being the next video, or it will be in one of the very soon coming videos if something changes. So we're going to continue to be diligent. We're going to continue to seek them because guess what? If you love them, what else are you going to do? You can say, oh, it never happened. I'm done. I'm out of here. Well, you want to go listen to confusion? You want to go listen to Matthew 24 teachings all the time? You know, you could leave and say, oh, I'm just going to study my word now. I've got the foundation. I'm just going to spend time in my word. 
congratulations. That's awesome. Go do it. But know that you can still always come back here or you can just stay here and do that and be a part of the community as well because we're going to keep diligently seeking, right? So just like somebody had shared, it was a part of a, a post in the forum as well from Romans 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. How many times have you heard this when people make posts, right? We know that all things work together for good. And what they fail to add to the end is to them that love God. To them who are called according to his purpose. Do you love God called according to his purpose? Part of the, the predestined, known before the foundations of the earth? I believe we are. I believe everybody in Christ Jesus, spirit-filled, absolutely is. All right? So now, before we now go into the whole thing and start breaking this all down, you know that I have to do this. For anybody that's new to the ministry, we've had a good uptick in subscribers. I want you all to know something. You can either go to ministryrevealed.com website and go to the link in the menu and, that says intro. Click on the intro and watch the first four videos in order. It will change your scripture understanding life forever. This is not a ministry of just seeking the day the Lord is going to come. It is his revelation being revealed that draws us closer in understanding when he is coming. It is the revelation that opens it all up. And if you don't go start there with those four, first four videos, you'll be lost. But the other place you can start is here. You can either do it uh, let's let this play for a second. Wix is your platform to perform on. Begins. So you can either do it from ministryrevealed.com on the website in the intro page, which is actually, I think it's personally the best place to do it because you have the first four videos. Then you've got the next videos in order that, that's called like dig, diving deeper. And then after those diving deeper videos, you've got the video about it's all a fractal, which will take you all the way back to in the beginning and show you the entire picture from the beginning of creation to the end of tribulation and the millennial reign. It is an incredible, incredible setup to watch it in that style. These first four videos right here on the playlist in the, um, on the Ministry Revealed YouTube channel, it's the it's called the intro, the gospels, uh, prophetic mysteries. No, it's this one right here. The revealed end time study note series. Okay, that's the playlist uh, on the YouTube link. These are the first four videos. This 22 minute video is the intro to the next three. So you get a bit of an idea of what it's going to talk about, and what it's going to go into, because when it hits you, it's like a punch in the face. You're going to be like, what? on earth you're going to come to hear in this 30 minute intro bible study the revelation of what we call who the gospels are speaking to john stands on his own but the synoptic gospels of matthew mark and luke in the end of days are actually luke mark and matthew the last will be first the first right the first will be last the last will be first you're going to see things like jesus going to the cross was arrayed in a gorgeous robe which means white radiant beautiful you're going to see in Mark, he was arrayed in purple. You're going to see in Matthew, he was arrayed in scarlet. We know they weren't colorblind. So what's the purpose? And you're going to understand that it is prophecy hidden in what people have called discrepancies within the Gospels, within these differences in the stories. Some people have tried, pastors, scholars have tried to explain away some of these differences by just saying it's perspective. But it's not. It is all prophecy. The is to come hidden within the is of the New Testament, just as prophecy is hidden 
in the was of the Old Testament, because as Ecclesiastes 1 9 says, it says, what was shall be, that's his to come. What is shall be, that's his to come. So things of the was, things of the is from the New Testament, both will play out in the end in typologies in the is to come. And that's what you come to find out in these differences within the gospels. That's what you're going to understand within simply the, the colors of the robes or the garments that he had. White, gorgeous, radiant, that's a bride's gown. Purple and scarlet, they're tribulation colors, are they not? You see, this is what you're going to come to understand. You're going to see that Luke is to the pre-trib Gentile bride of Christ. Mark is to the, to the world, the, the house of Israel that the Gentiles are grafted into. And then Matthew is to Judah. And when you understand this, you're going to see the, the, the discourses within the Gospels will also open to you. And when they do, you're going to realize the reason for the differences in the discourses is because it is not one set of seven years. It is two sets of seven years. In fact, the reality is it's three sets of seven years because it is seven, seven, seven. But the first seven, I want you to remember that, the first seven, remember that, not six, but the first seven, before they come to an end, there is a 50-day period of time that Paul calls above 14 years. Then from there, that is the Luke's discourse. It's not the whole seven years. It is, it is the, the easy, the, 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 or the, the 50 days, 40 days that comes first before the 14 years begin. And why was Mark and why were Mark and Matthew both purple and scarlet as tribulation colors? Because Mark's discourse is the picture of the seven years of seals, and Matthew's is the seven years of trumpets. You might say, well, what happens to Matthew for Judah then during the seven years of seals? Well, it begins the 14 years with the destruction, attack, and destruction of Jerusalem by Syria and those with Syria. Jerusalem will be destroyed, the Jews will be fleeing, and for the next seven years. Jerusalem is at ease. Only the foundation will get laid, but I don't want to go too down, too far down that rabbit hole. It will be at rest. And at the end of those seven years of seals, in that seventh year of seals, when the great multitude rapture comes in, then you will have the seven years of trumpets. And that, my friends, is Matthew's discourse then beginning. All right? You will see it is seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. And the portion for Luke is a period called 50 days above. The number one question that comes after that, oh my goodness, how could this have been missed? The answer is right here. It's all because of Matthew. This is a bigger study and it's fascinating. It's incredible. It will blow your mind, but you must start with these first to understand why it's all because of Matthew. Even though we have Luke's discourse, Mark's discourse, Matthew's discourse, how often do you hear, let's go to Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, it says, in Matthew 24, Matthew 24, this, Matthew 24, that. Because they've never understood who Mark and Luke are speaking to and why there's a difference for their discourses. Hello. When you do and you get to this point, it is going to blow you away. And you're going to realize pre, mid, and post debates is because they're all trying to assess them through the eyes of the gospel of Matthew. And when you go to the gospel of Matthew and somebody says, no, it's post-trib, they're the ones who are right. Because the mid-trib is Mark's and the pre-trib is Luke's. But everybody's stuck in Matthew. And so it doesn't matter where else they go in scripture. Whenever they find scripture talking about something that looks pre or looks mid, they try to put it in a connection to Matthew. And that's why everybody is so confused and twisted up. It's all because of Matthew. It'll blow your mind. You're going to see that pre, mid, and post is true. You're going to understand the discourse is revealed, Luke, Mark, and Matthew. The open books, the seven churches, all of it. 
it is absolutely worth every moment of everybody's time who is ever seeking and searching these things out with the Lord. It is worth it, I promise you. All right? So let's keep going. I'm a sip of coffee. Okay. So here's another thing, right? This is one of those things. When we read this, we can't help but say, <clears throat> this, is, this is what we're talking about. This is the kind of stuff happening all around the world, right? Okay, when the Lord comes, it's going to be division, right? He's going to be bringing division, father against uh, 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 son and daughter against mother and all of these things until it gets restored towards the end of seals. And what does he say to them? In Luke 12, 54, he says, and he said also to the people, when you see a cloud rise out of the west, straightway, straightway, you say, there cometh a shower, and it is so. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, there will be heat, and it comes to pass. You hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not discern this time? You see, we get this. Watchmen understand, and there are millions of watchmen around the world. It's not just ministry revealed. We have a greater understanding of when it begins here is how it's going to take place. But as for watching, there are millions around the world. And we're seeing these events happen at lightning speed around us. And what happens is we tend to think, ah, it's at such lightning speed, it's got to be now. It's got to be. Everything seems to be in order within the revelation. It's got to be now. But imagine what they were thinking in World War II. Yikes. Look at what we were, they were thinking in 1999 to 2000. Look at what they were thinking to 2012. Look at what we were thinking in 2017. Look at what we were thinking in COVID. So as much as it has ramped up since all of those years, there is no doubt because we're discerning these things in this time. But it doesn't always mean it's right now. And you're going to see what I'm talking about and why I'm sharing this. We can do this. We are discerning the season and the time. We know it. And it doesn't mean just because the potential of, of a time frame is later down the road, it doesn't mean we're not going to continue watching and discerning the season and time. It doesn't mean we're not going to remain diligent in seeking the Lord. Right? Here's the forum. It doesn't mean we're going to stop being diligent in supporting the ministry, in supporting our brother in Uganda. Look at what they're doing. He's going to the, what is it, the District Republic of the Congo and Kenya. Kenya's now asking him to come. There's churches everywhere. He's doing outreaches, 40 leaders coming from, like, I think a couple churches, and there's 28 churches that have six leaders coming from each. And what are they asking for, guys? Do you realize that they have only about, I think, usually it's like two or three Bibles in an entire church? All throughout these parts around around uh, uh, Uganda and Kenya and the Congo and so forth, these guys, this ministry, through Steve and his brothers and sisters that are helping over there in Uganda, and the brothers and sisters here that are helping support that ministry and the ministry as a whole, this is coming from us. The material is put together through brothers and sisters here in the ministry. The book it was the, writ, the the book here by Minister Revealed that we have. We pay to get them printed for a much better price in Uganda and the Bibles as well. And we give them away there for free. We don't charge them. This is the support we're doing. Imagine how tired our brother Steve is. And I don't mean tired serving the Lord. That's the exciting part. He is running, guys. He is running and he always is in need of our support. Just when we think, wow, man, I'm excited with the support that we've sent, there's still more. <laughs> because the more we're able to support him, the faster he's able to reach more people. And it's number one is salvation and teaching the gospel. 
Number two is the revelation of the open books, the, the revelation of the nearness of the season and time and the understanding of these things within the scriptures, as well as testimonials, children's books, food, building and repairing churches, buying a piece of land where they could build another church in a community, planting gardens, on and on and on. So guys, if you can, please remember, keep us, keep him, keep the ministry, keep us in your prayers. If you can, please support because you're going to see, you're, you may not be very happy with the time that I'm going to be showing we have left, but everything, Everything works together for his good for those who love him. All right. So I really wanted to share that as well and get the word out. This guy doesn't take breaks, man. He is running, running, running with his team. I think I told you guys before, even the printer now who read the Ministry Revealed book, who was running the printer for the books, read the book. And now he goes out with Steve. This is Steve, our brother Steve, who heads it there. He goes out with Steve and is preaching and teaching it as well. It's awesome. It's so exciting, guys. I'm so grateful. I'm grateful for all of it, for everyone. The prayers, the intercessions, the support. God is good. And I wouldn't be here without any of that in the Lord's will. So thank you always. Now, let me explain to you guys why, of course, we're always going to be watching. Of course, we're still excited, right? What about this child asteroid, right? This child asteroid, the child called, uh, the, the asteroid called child that is in the heart of Virgo as we speak. I mean, look at this. Look at that. You see the where it's highlighted in red. You see it coming out right there between the legs of Virgo. And it's right in that mid-September, right in that time frame of the Feast of Trumpets. When I look at this, this is why it was part of that last video that I took down. Because what are the chances? You see, I heard somebody say, Oh, people are crazy. That star has always been there. It was there from when the Lord created the sun, moon, and stars. That's obviously somebody who didn't watch the video from uh, Hourly Watch, I think it is. They haven't watched it to understand that it's not a star. It's an asteroid. What are the chances that this asteroid is here, that asteroid Yahushua is here, that another asteroid called United Nations is here? At this time in September, it's pretty wild, right? It's pretty wild, but unfortunately, it's not the only time. It has cycles, and these cycles run every three to four years, depending on the asteroid, for it to make its circuit around uh, the elliptical, which is not a, a standard elliptical that it follows. And I was talking with Mike today from 165, and he said, yeah, if you go back into 2018, you'll see that the, 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 those different asteroids all congregate together at this same place in 2018 as well. So, you know, it's not unique, but oh my goodness, did it ever seem like another sign in this time? You know what I'm saying? So it wasn't something that was just easily easy to dismiss. And I wasn't dismissing it. In fact, I still think it's very interesting. And it's still something that should keep us watching. But you guys know where I stand in relation to the timing. We're, this, this was our window. The window's gone. In fact, I don't even think the window goes to here. I believe the window is from right here. You guys know what has happened. You guys understand the revelation in this ministry. It is 50 days, 14 years. When do the 14 years begin? Well, you'll recall this video. 
You'll recall this video just a few back, but of that day and hour. If Matthew's discourse ends with, but of that day and hour, and Mark's discourse to the end of the sixth year, so the end of six years of Mark, remember? Six days as six years, after six days as after six years, that would mean 29th of Elul would mean the day and hour no one knows is the Feast of Trumpets. If you go to Matthew, six days of after six days, like after six years, that would be the 29th of Elul to the end of the six years of trumpets. That would be to the Feast of Trumpets. We've gone through these things. We've broken it down really, really well in this one, showing that it is going to begin the 14 years at the Feast of Trumpets. But what comes before the Feast of Trumpets. 50 days. 50 days comes before the Feast of Trumpets. You cannot get 50 days to the Feast of Trumpets. You following? So, so am I still hopeful that there's just something that that is still a mystery in this that we haven't yet been able to understand, that the Lord hasn't made known, that it's still going to start in trumpets? I mean, uh, uh, in Tishri? I don't think so. You guys know the story. You guys know the revelation. You know it's 50 days, 14 years. Not kind of, not maybe, not sort of. We have broken it down in such detail, all with Scripture, that we can't even bring it into question. I mean, you can if you want, but all you got to do is seek out what it says. So I, I, what do I do? I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful because that was unique, but I'm not going to go from event to event to event to event because as I said later, uh, earlier, we've graduated from that. We know the answer begins in Taurus. All right? So as much as I'm watchful for that, as much as I'm excited in, in a sense to, you know, giving a little bit more hope and to, to help strengthen people just in case that is, yeah, I'm hopeful. Well, here's another one to be hopeful about. Remember this, Exodus 34, 22, we've shared it many times, many times over the years. And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. Hello. This is the escape. This is the bride, right? The bride of Christ. Or it might even just be that it's the worker portion of the bride. Thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Well, we've shared on this year's end a number of times, right? You guys will remember this year's end is the same as <clears throat> excuse me, the circuit of the sun, right? This word for circuit, in fact, let me bring it up where you guys all can see it and understand it because there's new people. Let's go to Exodus 34, 22 first. And there's, there's a twofold reason why I'm bringing it up. Exodus 34, 22, and thou shall observe. So this is when you're going to do it. The feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end, okay? This is that word for end that has only four uses where it's come up. I believe two of them relate to the course of the sun or the circuit of the sun, and two of them mean a lapse of time, an end of a period of time, like 365 days in a year, whereas the other one relates to the sun. Well, one of the other places where this relates, <coughs> excuse me, is here, in Psalms 19, right? In verse four, it says, their line has gone out through all the earth and their words unto the end of the world. In them, he hath set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom. So the sun here is pictured as an image of the bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man ready to run a race. His going forth is from one end of heaven and his circuit, there's the word, unto the ends of it. So this is all about this rotation and this story in the sun, moon, and stars up above. So the question is twofold. 
this circuit, what is this circuit of the sun when it looks like this is when the son of man is going to come out from his chamber, having been with his bride for the one week that comes first that we know of, and then him coming out as a bridegroom ready to run a race. It would appear that it's connected to the circuit of the sun. Hello. How do we account for that? Well, some people think that maybe this circuit, as a year's end, with the with the feast of ingathering, some believe that it's connected to tabernacles. Well, if you want to connect it to tabernacles, which is the 15th of Tishri, or starting September 30th for the one week, then guess what? Maybe there is hope in that maybe we just haven't quite understood it and everything starts in the middle of Tishri. But then why would we have after six years and after, after six years of seals and after six years of trumpets, both being at the time of the day and hour, no one knows which is the Feast of Trumpets. How would the Jews even know what the Feast of Trumpets is if it's actually supposed to be somewhere in Kislev two months later? Hello. So you see, I, 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 I have hope, but I, I try to reason within these things and it leaves me kind of just going, eh. but there, there might be something we don't yet understand fully. So I submit to not understanding everything. I know I don't understand everything. What I do know, I know. But I don't know what I don't know. So I submit there might be something. How does it relate to account from, from Taurus, which is Savan, the third month of the Hebrew month, being the first? Well, that would make what? That would make Tishri actually the month of Av. And that would make, you know, we've talked about it before. And it would make the ninth month Kislev the seventh month of Tishri. We've talked about this before. That's the way it was back in the beginning. That's the way it was at the time of, of the Ark, the time of Moses. The year began in Taurus, which is the month of Savan. Okay, we've talked on this, we've revealed it, we've shared it, we've broken down, we've showed the history of it. it. It's a known fact. And we've broken it all down. You know, so one of the possibilities is to say, well, if that's where it is, is it possible then that Tishri isn't the seventh month, but to the father, it's the fifth month, which would be Av. And then the ninth month, which is Kislev, would be the seventh month of Tishri, to the father. And then that would make what? That would make Kislev one to the first to the second, the feast of uh, the feast of trumpets time to the father. Is that a possibility? It's possible. It seems a little bit like it doesn't quite make sense, but in the two months off understood from the sun. With the, the revelation, the one confirmation we've received from the Holy Ghost that it's Taurus, that we are right on target, that it is bullseye, that it is the eye of Taurus, noon, which is the 14th letter, the 14th brightest star in the sky, and it means bullseye. It means the number 50 in Hebrew as the 14th letter. So is it possible the Lord is counting it in those difference of months? Of months? It's possible. However, what else do we know? We know how the Lord works with harvests, right? We understand how the Lord works his harvest season. And if we were to go all the way to Tishri down here at the end of uh, in late September, that's not the time of the wheat harvest. Do you know what somebody's going to say? Oh, yes, it is. Well, you're right. Tishri into October, late Tishri, late September into October. It is a wheat harvest, but it is not the wheat harvest. As you guys know, we're not looking 
for a um, for a spring wheat harvest. Spring wheat belongs to Rachel. Winter wheat belongs to Leah. And where is winter wheat harvested? Where is the end of the winter wheat time frame? It's late July into early-ish August. It's the end to the corners and gleaning, which is the barley into winter wheat, which is just like Ruth. She stayed from the beginning of barley to the end of wheat. That was not talking about spring wheat. And we could prove it, of course, as we've done many times with the story of Jacob with Leah and Rachel. So this doesn't really jive with me. Because then that would mean Kislev. And down here in Kislev would be the time of the grape harvest. When new wine comes. Well, that's not true either. New wine is back here. You see what I'm saying? So when, when we look to say, well, what if we can follow this? Or what if we can follow that? And does it extend a little bit more? Well, we, we have to see the parts and pieces that we do know, that we have understood, that haven't changed, that don't change because they're there in their seasons. And so when I look at that, I say, mm, that doesn't really work for me. In fact, it's not about not working for me. It doesn't work for the actual timing of the harvests. In the physical sense, which is the Lord God's plan, it's all based on harvest model. So then I'm left kind of scratching my head, but I'm still hopeful. Because I can't say with the with 100% certainty. You guys know that there's never been a, the Lord told me this or a thus saith the Lord that, ever. It has all been through revelation and understanding what is being said. No Lord telling, just spirit leading and the revelation being understood. So what else is there? Is there maybe still something else? Oh, how about this one? What about the Book of Jubilees? Let's have a quick look at the Book of Jubilees. Ten days off, right? Remember this? And there will be those, and there will be those who will make observations of the moon. For this one, the moon corrupts the state at times and comes out early each year by ten days. Okay? Some people think, oh, maybe that's a possibility. Well, I agree. Maybe it is a possibility. And guess what? If we take the 26th of July, which was the seventh Sabbath, for the count of Av, to the count of Av from Taurus, where do we get to? We get to the 18th of Av, which is August 5th in two days from now. Am I hopeful? Yeah, I'm definitely hopeful. You want to see why I'm even more hopeful? Check this out. Our brother Ivan, you guys know him from South Africa. He's done so many awesome charts, charts for us, man. <laughs> I, I always give him credit for the charts because if I didn't have somebody to do the charts, I would. you guys would be lost as I'm trying to explain it to you. But this is one that he's done. And he's got it kind of in two portions. But I wanted to show you this. He He talks about um um where it kind of was in the beginning what is you know this feast of ingathering right so what we were talking about in exodus 34 22 what is this feast of ingathering is it just the feast of tabernacles or is it really related to the circuit of the sun well when we looked at the wording if we go back to exodus 34 22 and we look at this wording we see the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Here's the ingathering, right? Gathering of crop, right? A gathering of crops, okay? To take away, to remove, right? To re-reward. It kind of makes you say, hmm. And, and we've shared on this before, right? Look at how it's 614, and it goes to the root word, which is 622 almost looks like a June 14th to a June 22nd. And June 22nd would be what? That would be the time from the 21st into the 22nd being what? The circuit of the sun. 
at the year's end. Now, this year, that didn't happen, right? This year, it never happened. Let me show you something as a side note to what happens in 2024. Look what happens in June 2024. In June 2024, here's your 8th of Savan, which is the 7th Sabbath, and it's June 6, 14, and it would be the 7th Sabbath, not from the other side, as we've said, as we've been looking at, but from, I mean, not from this side, but from the other side, right? Now we're talking from a Nissan count to Taurus, okay? Not from a Taurus count going forward. So from a Nissan count, you end up 614, and it would be what? The seventh Sabbath. And then you have what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and the Lord returns what? About an eighth day from the wedding, and look what date it is, June 22nd at the circuit of the sun when he comes out with a bri as a bride, uh, as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. Uh, that's just a side note, all right? That's just a side note. I noticed that just as I was, I was pondering this before going, uh, before, you know, getting the video going. And I was like, oh, man, that's another piece that's pointing there. You're going to understand what I'm saying by another piece pointing to that time. All right. Right now, I want you to know that I'm not saying we're out of it. I'm not saying, no, 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 too bad. This is it. I'm saying, let's see these types of things. Let's see what Ivan's talking about in this difference of, of the year's end compared to the Hebrew 3318 year's end. And so what Ivan had the idea to do, which makes complete sense, that if you just take the entirety of the calendars away and you just go to Psalms 19, what the Lord says, that everything has been laid out for you in the sun, moon, and stars, whether you could read, whether you could write, whether you had a, a Hebrew calendar, a Gregorian calendar, a, 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 what is it, whatever calendar that's out there. If you looked up at the sun, moon, and stars and you took the time to understand them, you would see the answer. So this is what Ivan decided to do. And what he did is knowing that the moon is corrupted by X number of days, by, you know, by we know the 10 days going off and so forth. So if the moon is corrupted by 10 days and it could, it could build on those 10 days, Ivan went back to the time of the flood. He said, if you look at the time of the flood, in the time of the flood, the Lord God told, Mo, told uh, 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 Noah when to do these things. We know that even to the time of Moses, when the Lord declared in Exodus 12, this would be the beginning of your years. This will be the first month. This will be your count, 10 days and the 14 days to Passover. All of those things happened when the year began in Taurus. All right. It all was in Taurus when the sun and moon hadn't yet fallen off their course. So what Ivan did is he had the idea based on researching, you know, when when was the time of the flood? Even if you were off by decades or even a couple hundred or so years, it doesn't really matter because in that time, even up to Moses, the sun and the moon were still in their right place because it was still in Taurus. And the Lord told them, this is the beginning of your year, your months, and so forth. So that wasn't the issue. But he went back to this time of the flood. And it says the first day when the sun reached. So what he wants to do is if we're looking at the circuit of the sun, okay? That the circuit of the sun might be the time when the Lord returns to begin his 40 days. This is something we've talked about many times over the years. So what Ivan did, he said, what is the highest point the sun was in the year 2387 BC, the year of the flood? He went in 
and you found it here. You see it in Leo. And it was 2387 BC, seventh month, 14th day. So we go on. Uh, let's read it. In the above figure, I've used the elliptical line in red to help determine the exact date when the sun is at its most northerly portion uh, uh, position at the time of the flood. Notice the sun's position in relation to the star Regal in the constellation of Leo, and the moon is 17% waxing in the belly of Virgo. The date, according to Stellarium, is July 14th. Now, this is something I want you guys to remember. This is Stellarium compared to Gregorian. We're going to get to this. It is all about using the sun, moon, and stars, which has a year zero, which is how it should be. But it is not the reality we live in on the calendar we use. Hello. You'll see why that's so important. Now, let's determine when the Feast of, of Weeks occurred using the full moon that occurred just prior to the year's end at the time of the flood. So we went back. You'll notice where the sun is, and it was June 25th. So it says, according to Stellarium, it would have been June 26th, 19 days prior to the year's end. Now, using this reference point and days between the feasts being 19 days, because that's the way it was all the way back then before the sun and moon were corrupted, let's determine the corresponding dates in our time. First, the true year's end example at the Feast of Ingathering. So what does he mean by the Feast of Ingathering? Remember, he's believing that the Feast of Ingathering, one of the definitions for the Feast of Ingathering is the circuit of the sun at the summer uh, solstice. Uh, uh, yeah, at the summer solstice. All right? So if we went back 2,000 years, uh, 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 four or 5,000 years, we would see that it happened in August on August, or, or sorry, this is where it happened, okay? It happened in July 14th, and then it went back to where Feast of Weeks would be, which was six months of 25. When you go forward now, remember, everything has gone off by two months. It brings us to the same place. You see this? See that with the lion? There's the sun with, Re with Regulus. Where was it over here? Oops. Where was it right here? See that? See where it is? That was the peak of the sun in the time of Noah before the sun and the moon went off course. So he just copied... Where would that be? This is 2022, but it's also, he's got it here in 2023. It's the same time, okay? The sun in Leo with Regulus there, and he's got it here as August 24th. That's the exact same picture. In relation to the sun, remember the moon is, is even screwier. The sun is, is pretty predictable in it's being two months off now. And if we go back to the 19 days earlier, as it had to be in the time of Noah, you find that it's August 5th, where the sun is there, and look at what it was. There's your sun going back 19 days, as it was at the time of the flood. There's your sun in the claw of of uh cancer and in 2022 or 2023 in the claw of cancer august 5th and he's doing this by simply using the sun at its peak which is the summer solstice where it was 5000 years ago 4500 years ago and bringing that exact same point to when the lord made it known then and bringing it to that exact same point. So if we had no calendars, no, no clocks of any kind, and all we had was the sun, moon, and stars, and the constellations never change, which they don't, then this would be the exact same thing we'd be looking at. 
No accounting for the moon, none of that. Where is the sun? Going back 19 days to get to where the solstice was at the peak and going back 19 days to the Feast of Weeks. The exact same thing. And in 2023, it's August 5th. Well, that's pretty darn interesting, isn't it? Isn't that interesting? Because what was it? We were looking at July 26th, the 8th of Av. And we know that Jubilees also talks about not the sun, not the sun, but the moon throwing everything off 10 days. So Ivan's gone and found this difference with the sun and where it was to where it should be. And it turns out it's a 10-day difference. And we were told that the moon is off by 10 days. For me, that, out of all of these things, is by far the most hopeful. By far the most hopeful. You know, what? because you understand what it does, right? If we just seek it now to the sun and we follow it forward, well, we end up with, with this having a, a bit of offing. You know what I mean? It's not the first second to, to which one is the day and hour. It's a little bit off, right? It brings it further down into the month. Is it still reasonable? Is this still reasonable for the end of the winter wheat harvest? Absolutely. Is this still reasonable for the end of the wine harvest and the new wine? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, con it's got a connection to where the sun should actually be or where the sun actually is in comparison to history and 10 days off for the moon. So I am hopeful. I'm not putting all my eggs in the basket. I never do, by the way, because I don't know with 100% certainty, as I've told you guys since the very beginning of all of this over six years ago. I am hopeful. I'm expecting. I'm, I'm as absolutely committed to understanding as I could be when I share an understanding of time. This is only a couple days. We can endure that. Maybe that couple days connection, maybe, maybe it could take you to the 24th of Elul. Right? Maybe it gives you a little bit more hope. You got the 10-day 10, 10 count. Okay, if nothing happens. Maybe you go to the circuit of the sun. And maybe there's a difference within the circuit of the sun. Okay. All right. So these things can can help keep us uh, eyes eyes open always, right? Because there are certain things we know, guys. You want to be an Enoch? Are you an Enoch? Do you want to be do you want to be caught living in the world? Heck no. I know not a single one of the brothers and sisters here in Ministry Revealed want to be anything but an Enoch. Because Enoch did not taste of death. Because he pleased God, because he had faith. He believed that God was who he said that he was and that he was what? That God was a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So a date coming and going may frustrate you <laughs> a lot, right? It may bring you down temporarily, but we're still here. Not only me in, in, in the ministry, but the rest of the people in the ministry. You know, for some people, when I talk about this, it seems like, oh, Alan, okay, whatever, we get it. I'm not bothered by it, but I'm talking to thousands of people. And I know not everybody feels the same. So I'm speaking to everybody as a whole. I know for some, it's easy to take. 
And I know for others, it's almost devastating to take. We know some have serious health problems and don't know if they're going to make it if it goes further. And I'm, I, I shouldn't say I'm worried, but pray for our brother, Todd. I, I haven't heard from him for a bit. Usually he gets back to me. I know he was concerned about even making it to the end of July. And uh, so please pray for our brother, Todd. I, I hope and pray he's been in my prayers every single night as well, that uh, the Lord would just use him in a miraculous healing and let him be a testimony in that healing for the Lord to bring more people. Um, but I haven't heard from him in a little while. So, you know, prayers for our brother, Todd. Maybe somebody knows him, uh, talks to him a little bit more than I do and is closer. Um, but if somebody could let me know, I would appreciate it. Um, but, you know, I understand people have different health issues, work issues, right? Roof over their head issues. I get it. I've been all of those things before. And sometimes still on occasion. You know, I get it. But we can't force anything. We can't make anything happen like vanishing of tens of millions of people. We can't bring about the end of days. Not even those who are going to be doing the end of days can bring about the end of days. They're only moving in the preparation of the Lord's will when it comes. And they're just completely oblivious. We're not going to be caught unawares. Not a single one of us. That would be foolish. Foolish to have understood all these things you have been, you have been revealed. To draw closer to the Lord. Only to walk away and just go live in the world. That's like one of those definitions of insanity, right? We're here for you. We have the form. People can call. People do video talks and, and gatherings. People actually meet together for coffees. Our, our brother Robert came through Calgary to visit his in-law family with his wife. And, uh, and uh, Or was it with his son? I forget now. But was coming to visit family. And he was coming from B British Columbia in through Calgary here in Alberta. And we grabbed coffee uh, last, last week. Yeah, late last week. And it was awesome. I love that. I don't get a chance to hang out with many people. In fact, it's only him here in Calgary that I know of. And I've been considering based on how much time we might have left, maybe I start doing little road trips or something. <laughs> maybe I come up into the Edmonton area or, or Red Deer or somewhere in between. And, and maybe people, if they want to drive to that area, a small group of us, and they could invite friends and we can talk about these things and, and share the revelation. Um, parts of it anyways, to, to help bring understanding to family and friends that people might bring out. Maybe then I go to British Columbia, I go to Vancouver, an area, maybe start heading out to Winnipeg and Regina and head out east. You know, I don't know, maybe something. And I'm not saying I am going to do this. I'm saying I've been desiring to, to move, uh, you know, to, to do something more, Lord. But I'm okay if that's not what the Lord wills. You know, I can't do it. You know, it depends on availability, right? But at the same time, I just want to move in his will. I don't want to change anything that's going to hurt anything, right? So I understand, guys, but we're here for you. There's always somebody that can help reach out, that can help do what we can. We can't pay everybody's bills all the time everywhere, but we can help when we can. We might have thousands of people in the ministry but there's only, you know, at most two handfuls that, that do support on a regular basis. So we are grateful and we're appreciative, but just know we don't have the ability to help always with everything. All right. It's kind of these ebbs and flows. And plus, you know, we're, we're helping um, uh, Uganda, as we said as well. So just bear those things in mind for those that, that have contemplated supporting and those who maybe need help as well. Okay, but don't be afraid to reach out. You know, I've told my kids this since they were little. You never know if you never ask. You see, I've never been one of those guys that couldn't ask. I, I ne well, was never one of those guys that got lost because he just wouldn't stop and ask for directions back in the day, you know? It never happened. If I needed help, I asked. You know, what was this? This revelation came through speaking 
with the Lord and saying, Lord, just use me. I'll move in your will. And lo and behold, I didn't expect this, but you know, the Lord works in his ways, right? It's awesome. It's so awesome. So we're here for each other, guys. Remember, nothing changes. It, it's not, oh, it's not going to be 14 years. It's not going to be a 50 above the 14 and then the final jubilee. It absolutely 100% unequivocally case closed is a certainty. It is from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. It is proven true. None of those things will change. But what you're going to come to see is how that 14 plays out in, in, in the way we understood. But in this year count, that has probably left you scratching your head. You won't be scratching your head when we're done. Because for those, as I said in the beginning, who may have noticed something within the wording of scripture in a couple places, might have caught it in past videos. You'll see what I mean. Because 14 years and the above portion 50 days has never changed and never will. It's all true, right? The above 50, this is never going to change. Isaiah chapter 9, the picture of the start of the 50 days at the light affliction in northern Israel in two cities, and then the Son of Man coming and beginning his 40 days on the eighth day after he returns from the wedding, followed by when he finishes his 40, then the three days, the anointing of the Holy Ghost in what we call Acts 2.0, and then bam, Jerusalem, having been compassed about, is attacked and destroyed by Syria. 50 days after the 50th day later. This is an entire picture of the 50 days right here in a light affliction, which is the time frame of the escape of the pre-trib, a light affliction in northern Israel, the Son of Man coming on the eighth day for 40 days, and then after the 50-day anointing, bang, Jerusalem is attacked and destroyed. Not kind of, not sort of. It is right here. This is a picture of the was that shall be being played out again. We know it. We've understood it. And you see this? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. What do we know this relates to? Okay, we know this, we showed this incredible revelation that it was fulfilled in the is from the was in the time of Christ. But we also know it is a picture from the was in the is of the is to come. We've broken it down, we've shown it, and we had this incredible piece right here that said, now when Jesus had heard that John was in prison, well, we know the difference from when John and Jesus were still around was about two months. And after those about two months, John was now in prison for 10, day, uh, uh, for 10 months. We've known this for years. We've taught on it for years. So this means the period that Jesus came through to fulfill, as we've shared many times, this right here wasn't actually at the time of his birth, but was about approximately two months later. And it was very confusing for us because it said, for unto us a child is born, which was directly in our, in our Luke in order, chapter two, related to the birth of Christ in his 40 days. So it was very confusing for us for a while until we understood what was saying here in Matthew was that John was now in prison and so where did that take us? As you guys know, it took us from the time of Jesus's birth to about two months later. That would mean Jesus is 40 days after the wedding would begin at around where we are right now. Well, that would mean the escape would have had to happen in the 50 day start. That never happened. But remember what I just showed from last year. I mean, I mean, from next year. Look what happens if we go to next year. If we go to next year, we have the eight 
and then going to what? The 15th to the 16th. So there's your 8th of Sivan. Remember, I'm not I'm I'm no longer counting saying that about two months. What if we just stick from the Nissan count? We get the 8th of Sivan as the Feast of Weeks. And you get the after seven days when he returns on the eighth day, which is as the circuit of the sun. And guess when it is? His birthday. Hello. His birthday. Isn't that crazy? Here we are showing this difference within this being two months and the clarity of this that we had understood for so long being connected to his birth. And in 2024, it would actually be directly connected to his birth. Does that mean I think that's the date next year? No. Am I watching next year that that is a high potential possibility? Absolutely. But you know what we know is the scripture said, that that period of time wasn't actually Jesus' birthday. It was actually about two months after his birthday. We know that we've been given Taurus as the revelation. We know Taurus is the beginning. And in the beginning was the 16th, what is the equivalent now to the 16th of Savan, was the beginning of the word in the beginning of the Bible. It was the 16th day in the month of Taurus, which in the beginning was Taurus, which would have been, quote unquote, Nisan to the father or month one. So we know what we've been doing is this count as the 16th, like resurrection and doing the count, which gets us to the eighth of Av. And guess what? Of course, this is the time of bread this is the time of the winter wheat and the bread being brought in followed by 50 days later the new wine so <clears throat> i'm not uh, is as nice as that incredibly lines up i'm not going to discard it for next year but if it comes and goes i can still take a deep breath because we know the 50 days ends and when the 50 days end, the tribulation begins at true feast of trumpets. Remember, it has to be true feast of trumpets. Mark's discourse and Matthew's discourse equals after six years and after six years, after six years of seals, after six years of trumpets are both the feast of trumpets, the day and hour no one knows. So the reason why I'm bringing some of this stuff up is so that we don't we don't go off the rails. So we don't get too skewed in, in going in this direction and that direction. And what about this? Didn't we understand that? Didn't we understand that? Well, what does that free us to do over the next probable year? You heard me say it. I'm going to show you. What does that free us to do? It frees us to get things done that we need to do. It frees our mind to diligently spend it with the Lord. It frees our mind to be in prayer without always saying, Lord, I hope this is it. Lord, let it be this time. Lord, will you show it to me? You see what I'm saying? When you come to understand what you're about to see, there's there's a bit of a freedom. And for me, as difficult, my head was pounding today. I had like three hours of sleep last night. I, I drove my wife to the train and then came back and I ended up falling asleep for like three more hours on the couch when I came home. I just couldn't take it. I'm, I, my, it, it was too stressful to want to share this with you guys, knowing what it was pointing to. And yet at the same time, as much as it makes a whole bunch of sense, it just felt so crushing to have to share it. But you guys know something. I have never lied to you. I've been wrong, but I've never lied to you. 
I have never kept anything from you that I was knowingly understanding. Even the, even the again, as you guys know what that means, I didn't share it when I first started to understand it because it was such a serious thing. I needed to make sure I had ample groundwork to be able to make it known before I shared it. But guess what? Now it's generally accepted. We can understand why. We don't want it to happen, but it's willed for the Lord to happen with a purpose so we can accept it in the understanding. Well, that's the same with this. You're going to be able to accept it in understanding, and I believe it's going to, it's going to free your, your prayer life. It's going to free your, your life overall in general, not to just come and go as you please with the Lord. Not to just come and go and not bother spending time with your brothers and sisters in, in the community. But it will free you to get those things done that need doing. It will free you to not feel guilty that you're doing some of these things. A guilt that, oh, maybe I shouldn't because I should be watching for the Lord. It gives us a freedom to realize that watching for the Lord doesn't mean everything else that he knows needs to be done in our lives has to go on pause and everything starts to get crazy and out of whack. I think we'll be able to find a balance in this time that remains. And most of all, the reason I'm sharing it is because the joy of his revelation, just like everything else. Greater understanding of him brings greater joy. And we tend to lose sight of that often. Believe me, I know. We tend to lose sight. Just like the incredible revelation of the Gospels. The, the 14 years, the 21 and big picture. The, the open books. The creation story. The, the pre, mid, and post. The Lord coming at the in the seventh year of seals. Coming on heavenly Mount Zion, the rebuilding being the Lord there was with, with the modern day Zerubbabel and, and, and the Lord returning then later feet down on the Mount of Olives. We forget about these incredible revelations that have been given and we just say, Lord, what next? What next? We forget those things. And they're so incredibly exciting in the beginning, but then they become so common ground. So common knowledge for us, not for everybody else as we're trying to reach them, but they come, become part of our daily conversation in Christ and in, 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 in studies. So it's always exciting to get more, but it's always good to be reminded of the incredible mind-blowing wowness of what we've been given, which is his revelation. And so as much as this might be a little harder to, to take in, you're going to see it for yourselves. And I'm sure over time, over the next little while, as we teach and do other teachings and, and are digging and still going into all these things, because we can do this forever because it is his word that never ends and will never die. You see? So he can continue to give us revelation that we've never even considered being possible. Hidden in his word, as he's done for six years. Why couldn't he do it for one more? For seven years. Hello. Right? What do we know? Look at this. I'm going to sit you guys up here with this now. Look at this. Remember this? The whole story with Jacob and Leah and Rachel and all that stuff, right? Let's go to it in Genesis 29. Again, these are things we know. I'm, I'm leading you into something here. So we know what happened with Leah and Rachel, right? He worked seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days for the love that he had for her. So we know this is a picture of the 777 of those first seven years before they come to an end in that final seventh year. We know that there's a picture of these 50 days, which is 
but they seemed but a few days. So it's seven years, but in the excitement, it's only going to seem like a few days in the end. And that's the picture of the final 50 days, which is the picture of Luke and, and that connection to everything starting. So that's what? Seven years. Then he what? Fulfill her days, right? What what days did he fulfill? He fulfilled the days. Ah, he fulfilled her week for the wedding. And then he had to work seven more years, right? He got Rachel, but he still had to work seven more years to fulfill that commitment. After he fulfilled those years, what do we know the time was? He tells us that he spent, what, 20 years with his father-in-law. 14 years. A lot of people get confused. 14 years for thy two daughters. This isn't the 14 years of the end of days that we talk about. Seven of these 14 years are the years that we're in right now. The, the quote-unquote easy years that he was working expecting Rachel but got Leah. All right? That's the first seven. And they felt like days. The next seven of these seven is when he has then Rachel, but he has to work seven more years for her. Those seven years are the picture of the seven years of seals. And six years for thy cattle. This is a picture of the six years of trumpets. Okay? This is a picture of the six years that takes us to the end of what we call the seven years of seals and six years of trumpets, leaving one more year. Okay, so this is a big picture of 777 being seven easy, seven more years of seals, seven years of trumpets. But at the end of those six years of trumpets, what do we know it equals? We know at that point, the Lord returns as lightning from one end unto the other. The whole world will see him coming on the clouds. It will be made known to all. And he, what does he do? He's going to renew the covenant that he made at the beginning of trumpets that had to be broke at mid trumpets when Satan was released and the pit was opened. He is now returned feet down on the Mount of Olives, as you guys all know, with that final second sword. And then he will renew the covenant in that final 14th year what happens in the same picture of seven seven and six it's the same picture 20 years is the same as saying 13 years this the seven easy that weren't part of tribulation but of the preparation of the bride those seven years are just moved and then you've got 13 left of seals seven and trumpet six and then what happens he makes a covenant with his father-in-law at the start in that 14th year. Well, we have this story elsewhere too, right? We have the story of Abraham. Abraham, they were to have a child. They didn't wait. Him and Sarah, they end up having, uh, well, through, yeah, through, the, through the, the maiden, right? They end up having Ishmael. How old was Abraham when he had Ishmael? He was 86 years old. 86 years plus 13 years is 99 years old. 99 years old. So 13 years, hello. 13 years have passed. 13 years are over. And what happens? God makes a covenant with Abraham and his family. And it even tells you that Abraham was 99 years old. And Ishmael was now 13 years old. What happens when you go to Genesis 21? The birth of Isaac. It says Abraham is now what? A hundred years old. The 14th year, a hundred years old, and the promise comes. You see, we know these things. We have understood these things. I'm going to update these charts with this year count. It's not ready to put out yet. I don't know that I'm going to post them quite right away. I wanted to assess these things and go through them even more, but they might be up in uh, another video or two, or maybe you'll find it in a couple of days. 
under this video that the links will be updated. So you see, this is the picture right here. There's your seven years of, of flying by like days. Then you got your seven years of seals that he had to complete for Rachel. Then you have your six years of the cattle. You see, then he makes a covenant at the end of it. What was it with Abraham after 13 years? Same with after 20, bang, covenant, covenant. What does it say in Daniel? That final year, he renews the covenant. That final week, which is the final year, is the Lord renewing the covenant in that final 14th year. Because why? Because the Lord, at the start of this final 14th year, has returned feet down on the Mount of Olives for the whole world to see. He's put an end of everything. And now what is he going to do? He is going to bring the sword upon all the enemies of his on the entire earth. And he's going to lay out their bodies in the treading of the grapes. And it's going to be, I couldn't even imagine. But do you notice something? It's what? Seven years. Seven years. Seven years. What, what starts? What, what started? What began our first seven years? What began the first seven years? Can we even understand it? Can, can we know what started the first seven years? Right? We knew that it was trumpets. Okay, we already covered that. Is it possible that the Revelation 12 sign in 2017 was the beginning of the first seven years? You see, as much as this child asteroid and this stuff going on with Virgo is interesting, does it have nearly the reach that the Revelation 12 sign, not the literal event, but the sign of it. Is it possible that it happening at the Feast of Trumpets in 2017 was the beginning of the first seven years? You see, we, we, it's something we hadn't really considered in a long time. And this is something I was talking about in the beginning. This is a point I was making that over the past year and a half, people have started to wonder if maybe this first seven years, this easy, fast passing like day seven years, maybe it was connected to September 2017 in the sign. It wasn't as we know the actual event of the revelation chapter 12 one that is going to happen but it was the sign it was the sign that what something started do you realize tens of millions of people around the world were watching this churches all over the world were talking about it do you know how many were talking about the child not many. There's just a few that are talking about it within the circles of prophecy in the Western world. The Revelation 12 sign that Scotty had spent so much time that we've been saying for years was important because that was the beginning for so many people that woke up in 2017. I remember the last time I spoke about this, maybe a year or two ago, maybe even longer, that the importance of the Revelation 12 sign in 2017, think about how many people you know, or yourself even, how many people things changed in 2017 and you became a watchman, you were looking and seeking. Think about how many people were watching, but not really, and went back to the world and mocked and scoffed the Revelation 12 sign. You see, I believed early on from later in September that when you go to the understanding of Revelation chapter 12, 
and you go to the wording when you use a program like eSort, and it says there appeared a great wonder. It's to gaze, that is, with eyes, with, uh, uh, with wide open eyes at something remarkable, thus differing from G991, which denotes simply voluntary observation, and from G1492, which expresses merely mechanical or passive casual vision. The Revelation 12 sign of September 2017 was a voluntary observation of something mechanical and of casual looking at. It was not at something to gaze at with eyes wide open that you look at and you're like, ah! That's what's coming when the 14 years begin. You see? But seeing that it was something that was never seen like that in thousands of years, nor going forward in that exact setup, do you think it's possible it was our sign that began the first seven years? Do you think it's possible, knowing what we know and the details that we know now, that when we do a Taurus count and we get to the seventh Sabbath and we do a 50-day count that takes us to the last day of Elul, that then starts with Tishri, which is the attack on the Feast of Trumpets to begin the 14 years. And that when the first six years are over, it's the day and hour in Mark that no one knows, which means it's the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion at the Feast of Trumpets after six years, meaning the beginning of the seventh year is the Feast of Trumpets. And then you go to Matthews, and after the six years of trumpets, at the end of 29th of Elul, you get the day and hour no one knows, which is the final year, which is the, the, the story of the ark, which is the story of Noah, which we showed in the Noah 2.0, which I'm going to bring clarity to all of it for you. You see, these things haven't changed. If it's after six years is Feast of Trumpets, if after six years of Trumpets is Feast of Trumpets, if after the final year of Noah is the Feast of Trumpets and 10 more days to the blowing of the trumpet for the Jubilee that follows, then it's all going to start at the Feast of Trumpets. So if it starts the 14 years at the Feast of Trumpets, where do we think the first year started? Uh, Feast of Trumpets? How about Ministry Reveal? Oh, see, it always resets when I try to do this. You guys know the story of Ministry Reveal. Ministry Revealed <clears throat> did the first video, I did my first video <clears throat> in 2017 on June 16th to 17th, it was divided into two portions. First, it was one video, 30 minutes. I posted on the 16th, 30 minutes. I posted on the 17th. Look at what that is, by the way. That would be the, the connection to the eighth day that we were talking about. Seven years later. In 2024. Kind of interesting, right? Especially when you go and look at what that first video was about the mark of the beast, talking about the PCR machine and what the PCR machine does and how it would be used as a prelude to the mark of the beast for testing people with viruses going in and out of countries. I spoke about that right here on the 16th, 17th of June of 2017. And three years later, something that none of us had heard about unless you were in the pharmaceutical industry, PCR machines were being used to test people going in and out of countries. Did I know the Holy Spirit was leading it? No, I, I had suspicions that something was going on because it was an incredible video about the mark of the beast, but I knew nothing yet about the gospels, nothing, nothing about the 14 years. I was just talking the same stuff, everybody else, Matthew 24. And then what happened? 
September 8th, September of 2017, like so many other people, their lives changed and they began to watch excessively, like they became watchmen and watch women from that period of 2017 because things started to open to them. Things suddenly started to become real, if you will. And though every so many people I know, including my own, their lives changed in 2017. And on September 8th, 2017, in that video that's still posted, that was the day I talk about it in the book. I talk about it on the website. That was the day that I said, wait a second. I, I noticed something. And what I noticed, as you guys know, was that Revelation 12, 1, everybody was saying this was caught up child was the pre-trib rapture. Yet I remembered in that moment that Isaiah said, before she travailed, she brought forth. Before the travailing, there was a bringing forth. And then after the travailing, but before the pain, there was a bringing forth of the man child. So it certainly had to be before the dragon and the horns and the heads. It had to be before the stars fall. It had to be before she brought forth the child who was to rule all nations because he's not ruling anything at the beginning of tribulation. It had to be before. It, it couldn't be this was caught up. And lo and behold, that was the beginning from September 8th. Then the Gospels began to open. And within a short period of time, I think it was sometime about mid-August, That uh, sorry, mid-October, that 2 Corinthians chapter 12 opened, and I noticed that there was the exact same wording was caught up as Revelation 12, 5. And yet there was another one like a rapture that came first that went to the third heaven. And when I read that it was those in Christ above 14 years, I about lost my mind. Because it was revealed in what was shown to me first, which was that the Gospels were speaking to different groups. And when you understand one relates to the above, one relates to the first seven years, one relates to the second seven years, poof. I was crying all the time like a little baby because I was freaking out at all the revelation. Well, that knowingly began for me. September 8th. So is it possible? Our tracking number that we've been desiring to know when the first seven years began? Is it possible? It was the Feast of Trumpets 2017 knowing we're looking from Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets in the year counts? knowing that there was a first seven years and not six. Knowing that this ministry, and people have asked that of me as well over the last year, is it possible like the Revelation 12 sign that when this ministry really officially began, it was a, it was a pointing, if you will, by the Lord? Like Revelation 12? Why? Well, because this is the ministry. We're the, we're the ones that for some reason he's given us the revelation. Whether people want to believe it or not, that's their problem. The scriptures have proven it, and that's why you're all here understanding it. Doesn't it make sense that there's something so attention catching, catching throughout the whole earth to tens of millions of people to give us the sign of the beginning? At trumpets, the first seven years, knowing that there's a portion above 50 days before the trumpets of the 14 years start, which is the portion still in the seven years, those final 50 days. You see what I'm saying? This is why in 2023, I still look hopeful especially to what's coming with what Ivan, discussed, uh, what Ivan had put together. 
But everything else is already screaming. This is the beginning. It's this time from right here. This is this is the start of the 50 days. It was the purpose for the Holy Spirit telling us right on target so that we would get Taurus, that we would get the bullseye of Taurus, that we would understand it. But this starts to bring in a few other things into question now, doesn't it? So let's have a look at that. Let's let's have a look into let's start with having a look into this Shemitah year chart. Okay? I want you to notice something. This is the Shemitah year chart we've been using up till today. So get ready to scrap your Shemitah year charts and the new one will be made available. But I'm going to give you the understanding of it first. This is the entire purpose of the video being called zeros and ones, okay? That this difference is about zeros and ones. This chart here gave us a seven-year Shemitah count. And how do we know it's an accurate seven-year Shemitah count? Because we know there's a seven, a seven, and a seven. We know, in fact, that that younger guy, Bible guy, oh, uh, shoot, what does he talk about? Uh, I can't remember his channel name or his name. Um, it's been shared in the forum a few times. Many, many people have seen it, um, where he shows 777 seven, throughout the Bible. He shows, you know, uh, five sevens and 777 seven, seven, and 21 and three seven, right? Three seven, like three times seven, 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 seven. It is the revelation of the end of days, but nobody besides us has really caught on to it yet. That's what this is why I've been sharing with you this this seven 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 and and the the seven being twenty and then the final year with the Lord here and it being like the first seven were easy they're removed like these seven they really only are about the the final three day uh, the final fifty days before the feast of trumpets. When the final 7-7 seven, seven will play. <clears throat> so what have we needed to understand? Well, if we know the final two sevens of 14 are the last two Shemitahs before the Jubilee, then all we have to do is go back counting 7-7-7-7-7. Seven, 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 seven. And that's what we did all the way back. <clears throat> all the way back. To the birth of Christ. But you know what I screwed up on? Because I, which way was I going to go? This is something we've talked on more than once. Year zero or not year zero? Year zero or starting at year one? Which one should it be? Well, I can tell you which one it should be. <coughs> it should be a year zero. And I don't mean starting at year zero. I mean having a year zero in the count. Do you know that there should be a year zero? Why should there be a year zero? Because in the sun, moon, and stars, there was a zero. So what would happen is you would have minus, so you would hit minus two and then you would fulfill it. And then you would have minus one and then you would fulfill it. So AD, uh, I mean BC, then you would have zero because you had to fulfill minus one. So you turned minus one, right? One BC, and then you had to fulfill the 365 days. Then you would get to zero and then you should fulfill 365 days because now you're on the AD side and it should be then one. That is what we were teaching. And it is true when you're born, is it not? You're born and when you, when you turn one, you have completed one. Yet they still call you one until you're two, even though after you're one on your birthday, the very next day, 
you're starting your second year. But what calendar am I on? <clears throat> what year count calendar are we on? What, what calendar? What calendar do we use in everyday life? August, September, October, November. The entire world, even if they have their own calendars in different areas, the world as a whole, including us, are on the Gregorian calendar. <clears throat> do you realize even the Hebrew calendar is built into the dates of the Gregorian calendar? Do you realize because of the Gregorian calendar, the Jews have their Sabbath from a Friday into Saturday <clears throat> because it's still always a seventh day, but it's not the actual seventh day of rest that it should be. But they do it because it is still a seventh day continuously. But why did they do it? So it fit in a Gregorian calendar because the world runs on a Gregorian calendar. And every Friday to Saturday, Saturday is the weekend. That's essentially the way it works in every Western nation and, and in many parts of the world. We are running on a Gregorian calendar. And so what did I do? I had built in a sun, moon, and stars year zero in a Gregorian calendar that does not use or count a year zero. Damn it. You can see why I was a little bit ticked off. My wife said to me, when I was explaining it to her the other night, my wife said to me, why didn't the Lord, why did the Spirit make this known to you months ago? Because you know what it would have been? It would have been like a year and a half to two years of having to watch, knowing the expected date wasn't until the point in 2024. Imagine how hard that would have been. You see, remember we looked at everything. This could be possible. This could be possible. This could be possible. And then we were able to refine it as we got more understanding. And then we were able to refine it as we got more understanding. And then it was only six months. We didn't look at any specific date. We just grew in the Lord. And then we only looked at a couple things, as I was telling you earlier. And then it got refined again. And we know this count is from Taurus. Well, now we are refined to the point of what? There is no, you're not going to hear, oh, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. Here it is, count to this, here it is. Nope, because the count is from Taurus. The count is from Taurus, 16th day, begin the seventh Sabbath true count to the true feast of weeks where the bread of the winter wheat harvest is presented and 50 days later is the new wine. You don't believe it? Why was the Revelation 12 signed September at, trunk, at the Feast of Trumpets? Why is Mark's discourse, Matthew's discourse, the day and hour no one knows after six after six? Because it's the Feast of Trumpets. So, do I think there's going to be other times? Am I hopeful in these events still to come? Yes. Am I laying down this is where it is in these coming events? No. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that there's still something the Lord hasn't made known and, and there might be something in there. But when everything else is trumpet started, trumpet starts it, trumpet and six, trumpet and six, the, the 14th year ends at trumpets, has 10 days to atonement. Then the Jubilee is blown. How much more do I need? It's screaming in our face trumpets to the point that the seven years, the first seven of the entire story, 
began at trumpets. So what I had done, it didn't even cross my mind that I had included a sun, moon, and stars true year zero in a Gregorian count of years that has no zero in it. So what do you think that did? Whoops. What do you think that did? It pushed everything by a year. Right? It moved everything by this one year. It added, I should say, a year. Do you know what happens when you get rid of the zero? Everything of ye the year count, not the Jubilees, uh, uh, sorry, not the Shemitah counts, but the years slide down by one. The years slide down by one. Do you know what doesn't slide? The 70 years to the count that we've been looking at for Israel doesn't change. And you're saying, well, what? How could that not change if it's going to 2024? How can it still be a 70 years from when they came into the land? Don't worry, I'm going to show you. How? Wh what about this? That means if it all slides, if it slides down, then what happens is this changes. This changes. And what ends up happening is 70 years for Jerusalem is no longer in the 14th year when it ends. It's actually the end of the 13th year where 70 will be. You'll see what I'm getting at. I'm going to show you all of this right now without being too, too much longer. And we'll cover it more and we'll, we'll bring clarity to it in upcoming videos. So see what happens is I'm counting years again on a Gregorian calendar that did not acknowledge year zero. Yet I have added a year zero for the sun, moon, and stars that does account for it, but I shouldn't have because I'm in a Gregorian calendar for crying out loud. We observe our years by the Gregorian calendar, period. So what happens if we remove that Gregorian calendar, uh, uh, that year zero? Well, look what happens. It begins in 2 BC. Well, isn't that interesting? Isn't that exactly what everybody says? If you go to Stellarium, it would be 1 BC. But if you use it in a Gregorian year count, they all tell you it was 2 BC. Hello. So that's why when you go read history and you go read these things with we've shared in the past with Herod and which Herod, you know, they'll tell you 4 BC. Another one says, yeah, there was one for 4 BC, but there was this other one that was connected to 2 BC. You realize, ah, or the or the count of the kings, which we're going to cover. When you do this count of the kings and you always you realize there's a difference <laughs> in a count from 19 to 21 years because of the difference of whether it was the house of Israel or the house of Judah. You see, we've done this study. We know that Herod was 2 B.C. We know that Christ was born in 2 B.C. in the history books in a Gregorian calendar conversion. Even though, according to the sun, moon, and stars, it was 1 B.C. That's because... As I've said, Gregorian does not observe a year zero. So I needed to remove the year zero because these are Gregorian year counts. So what happens? Here it is on this side right here. 2 BC, birth of Christ, 
1 BC at his birthday. So he is born, right? He's born in 2 BC to one year at his birthday in 1 BC. Okay? So the first number in the year column represents Jesus' birth at the third month, 15th day. We've shown that, okay? We know he was born in the third month, 15th day of a Hebrew calendar month day. But in a Gregorian calendar year, you see, we can show the month and day of the Hebrew calendar month, but in the Gregorian calendar year, it was 2 BC. The age of Jesus, uh, the age Jesus turned at the completion of each year at his birthday, okay? So that's this darker side right here. So he was born, he started his first year, and he ended his first year. So from birth to year to one year old. So we come right up here, no year zero. And he was one year and one day unto his birthday in 1 BC. And he completed his second year. He started it at one year and one day. He completed it in 1 BC at his birthday when he now turned two. Okay, so that same thing still applies. And you see here, important note, there was no zero, year zero in the Gregorian calendar, which is what the world uses. Okay, so I put that note in there. Look what happens if we keep going up. In a, the Sabbath year now, see what changes? It now makes it the Sabbath year when Jesus began to be about 30. You remember that? Remember that in Luke chapter 3, something we've shared on a number of times lately because it was such a fascinating find? We go to Jesus began to be about 30 years of age. When do you begin to be? When do you begin to be about 30? The day after you complete your 29th year, day one after you're now in your 30th year. Well, that year would have been a, a Sabbath year, a Shemitah year. Isn't that amazing? Because that year, as we have shared many times, that year, John was still alive. Remember, it was part of what we were talking about earlier, the two months approximate difference, and then the 10 months he was in prison. Jesus was still here, or John was still here during Jesus's first uh, uh, accession, if you will, in his first year of being set up to be then the sole one that when John was beheaded, everybody now turned to Jesus. We've talked on it many times. The world has missed it. The world has missed that Jesus was actually here for about four and a half years, approximately four and a half years. Because they missed the first year that he was here while John was here. There was the about two months where he was gone in the wilderness. Then he came back. He chose his disciples. He, he was baptized. He had baptized them. And then they were baptizing in an area while John was baptizing in another, according to John chapter 3. So we know it was about two months before John was then taken into prison. And then was in prison for 10 months. This entire year, which was 28 AD, when Jesus had completed 29 years and he began to be, he began to be 30 and completed 30 in 29 AD, that's when he began and completed his 30th year, which is still precisely what we have taught as Luke 3 said, because 28 AD is the year of Tiberius Caesar in, his 15, in the 15th year of his reign. And the shroud and the documents and the coins that were on Jesus' eyes showed that in 29 AD was the 16th year of Tiberius Caesar. Which means when Jesus began to be 30 in 28 AD, it was the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, precisely as Luke chapter 3 tells us. 
this was a Sabbath year. So how fitting that when Christ shows up at this time, it was a Shemitah year. It was a Sabbath year. And it was the time while he was setting things up while John was still here. And then once John was beheaded, Jesus now began to be 31. He was now 30 years old and about a day or whatever. And it was now solely him for one year, two years, three years, and about a half, a little bit more. Exactly as we've been teaching. Nothing in this has changed except the alignment of it to the first year of Christ while John was still here with him or in prison was a Shemitah year. That's actually very fitting. And then what happens? So all of this is still completely in order as we have understood it. Now it's going to get interesting. This is the part where it gets most interesting. And it has to do with Israel and when they came into the land. You see, for us, this issue seemed to be resolved with when Israel came into the land. When they came into the land, when they had their elections, when they planted the trees. Well, I got a story for you. I don't know about you, but I thought when Israel came into the land, I thought they had Jerusalem. I thought Israel came into the land in 1948, and when they became a nation in 1948, I thought they officially had a portion of Jerusalem. Now, you might say, why does that matter? Well, it completely matters. Do you remember what G what the Lord said in Leviticus? Let's go to Leviticus 25. Does the Lord God, does the Father care, quote unquote, he cares about everything in the whole world, but what belongs to him that he calls his land, the land that he brought them to? The, it, does it matter that it's all of Israel? Or is it Jerusalem? Look at what it says in Leviticus 25, verse 23. The land, the land shall not be sold forever. The land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. Is he talking about all of this Israel land from north to south that, uh, that they got when they became a nation? No. He's talking about Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the land that belongs to the Father. So what do you think if we go into Leviticus 19 and we have another look at it, listen to what it says. For when they shall come into the land. Well, how about that? How about that? For when they shall come into the land and shall have planted all manner of trees. Here's our three years can't take from it. The fourth year you give it to the Lord. And then the fifth year forward, it's yours. But I, I believe we and many others believed that when they came into the land and became a nation in 1948, we believed they had a portion of Jerusalem. Well, guess what? I was wrong. They didn't have a portion of Jerusalem. How does this prove that it has to be Jerusalem with just these couple of verses? Let me take you to another one that we know like the back of our hands. Has anybody ever questioned this before? I believe a number of you have, and I believe I've actually seen the comments to it because I myself have also wondered about it. Listen to this. Zechariah, starting in chapter 1, verse 12. 
going to end verse 14 as well. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which you have had indignation these 70 years? Well, in a year zero being added this year would have had to have been it. But when there is no year zero and things slide down by one year, it no longer counts. It no longer lines up or makes sense using Israel when they came into the land. Does the Lord care about Israel? It says, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem? And the cities of Judah. This is all about his land. We've taught on this before. This angel is saying, how long are you not going to have mercy on your land, Father God, that these sojourners are on, defiling it? And what does he say in verse 14? So the angel that communed with me said unto me, cry thou, saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous. Listen to this. For Jerusalem and for Zion with great jealousy. Jealous for Samaria? Jealous for Israel? Or jealous for Jerusalem? It's jealous for Jerusalem. The question was, and the, the important thing we needed to know which I thought they had when they came into the land was a portion of Jerusalem before 1967 when they now got the rest of it. Well, lo and behold, as I'd been pondering these things and praying over these things, they didn't have a portion of Jerusalem in any official capacity when they came into the land in 1948. Do you know what happened when they came into the land in 1948 on May 14th? The same day in the evening of May 14th, 1948, a war broke out. So on May 14th, 14th during the day they signed their their documents to be able to become a nation because this british mandate was expiring and it was expiring on may 15th so in the last moment israel signed it and were officially declared a nation but do you know what it didn't include? It didn't include Jerusalem. They then, the very next day, were attacked by Arab nations on May 15th, 1948. And the battle, the war lasted until March 10th, 1949. Hello. What was the battle over? These, these settlement disputes and what was going to take place over Jerusalem. Look what happened. We get a, a bunch of insights. On July 20th, 1949, Israel's 19-month war of independence officially ended after signing an armistice agreement with Syria. So what had happened is there was more than one agreement. You see, they were in a war with, here it is right here, over the course of 1949, because when this war broke out, it was a war with Egypt, with Lebanon, with Jordan, with Syria, and even Iraq. So that war that broke out on May 15th, 1948, was Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, and Iraq. 
And throughout the course of 1949, they went into agreements with Egypt in February, Lebanon in March of 1949, with Jordan in April, and Syria in July, on July 20th. That's what this is talking about right here. July 20th of 1949. But Iraq did not sign any armistice agreement with them, but they were, they were already withdrawing their forces in uh, March of 1949. So at this point, they still did not officially have any portion of Jerusalem still at that point. Then what happened is there what was called the Luzain Protocol, Luzain Protocol, and this was about the division of Jerusalem. Where's the rest of the info? Oh, there was something I wanted to click at somewhere. Shoot. Was it on this one or on this one? Oh, I forget which one. Uh, give me one second. Background. Armed forces. No, shoot. I think it was this one. Anyways, what had happened is... They went into all of these armistice, into all of these agreements, of which the final one was on July 20th. But during all of this, they still weren't given their official boundaries. You see? The boundaries. Oh, that's what it was. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Oh, I see. It got all mixed up over here. Let me refresh the page. Let me refresh the page. Oh, why is it doing that? You see how it's all cramped up over here? Here it is, borders. So there was this armistice line, which is called the green line. Check this out. I think this is where it is. There you go. So the armistice border and the demarcation line of 1949 that took place, this demarcation line called the green line, see? The green line that you hear um, the Arabs and uh, Palestine always, always, always referring to is they want Israel to go back pre-1967. These are the lines of Jerusalem for what Israel had and the other portion. But what happened is in 1967, when Jerusalem captured more land and captured the rest of Jerusalem, they've been building in those other areas. So even though they say no, and then the Palestinians are all upset with them and wants them to go back, and the world wants them to go back to pre-1967, it did not begin in 1948. It wasn't until July that the final armistice was signed but they did not get the green line demarcation zone that became their borderlands for Jerusalem until the fall of 1949. It wasn't until the fall of 1949 that they received the armistice demarcation lines of 1949. You see, it wasn't until the war started, till they signed these agreements, then they went into conferences, then they had what was called. So while this was going on and all of these agreements being made and the Lausanne Protocol taking place, the issue of Jerusalem was regulated, uh, was relegated to a subcommittee called the Committee on Jerusalem. Hello. While all this was going on in around July to summer into the fall of 1949, there was another Committee of Jerusalem 
deciding these lines of who would receive what portion agreed upon for Jerusalem. And the Jews agreed to divide Jerusalem and the Arabs kept saying, no, 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 no. But the Jews wanted a piece of Jerusalem in their lines. Brothers and sisters, they did not get it until the fall of 1949. Why does that matter? Because the Lord God has been talking the entire time of these 70 years from when they came into the land, when they had a piece or portion of Jerusalem. These 70 years can only be two options. Either the 14 years are going to begin, the tribulation is either going to begin in 13, 14 years from now, at the end of 1967, 70-year count, and that's what Zechariah 1 is talking about, or, and we know it's not true, we know it's not true because Zechariah 14 is the day of the Lord representative of his year. Hello. So this cannot be the end in a 1967 year count. It has to be from a 70 years when they came into the land and had a portion of Jerusalem. Well, guess what? That never happened, you see, until the fall of 49. Now, listen to this. Listen to this. Let me see if I could increase this a bit for you guys. Okay? Listen to this. 1948, okay, May 1948, they came into the land, and they immediately went to war. And it was all these demarcation lines and everything else. And Jerusalem, they had no peace of. They had this war until the springtime, summer of 1949. So Israel became a nation, May 14, 1948, but did not yet have a portion of Jerusalem, God's land. 1949 to 1950. After the Arab-Israeli War, which began May 15th of 1948 and ended on March 10th of 1949, Agreements were settled and in the fall, so agreements were made until July, and then they went into negotiations with UN and all that stuff and had a subcommittee, as you saw, a separate committee over the division of Jerusalem. These agreements were not settled until the fall of 1949 when Israel, the Jews, received their portion of Jerusalem. In the later fall, very important to understand, in the later fall of 1949. Okay? So guess what happens? The first year. So they would, the, if we're looking at the planting of trees for Leviticus 19, the official planting of tree from when they had a portion of Jerusalem now, which was in the later fall of 1949, then they would have planted their first tree in that count from Jerusalem in around January, February of 1950, Jerusalem. Okay? Now look what happens. The first year began as per the accession year count of Judah, Tishri 1st of 1950. Do you guys remember what I'm talking about? Remember what I'm talking about? The difference between accession and non-accession that we've shared on many times. This difference that was found between a 19 and 21 year because of what? A year 20? A, a year with a zero? There was always a difference of a one or a two years? How many times have we gone through this 
And now it's revealing the same mystery from a year zero to a non-year zero, starting with one. Zeros or ones. It's been a confusion that was a mystery of what became, as you guys know, the accession or non-accession year method, which means for anybody that's new, the house of Israel counted their year from Nisan 1 for the house of Israel. If a king had died somewhere before Nisan 1 of this following year, then all of those months, however long it might have been, until Nisan 1, were called non-accession for the house of Israel. And what that means is whether it was one month or 11 months difference, that period of time was considered to the house of Israel, their king having completed one year, even if it was one month. And when they got to Nisan 1 for that new king, Nisan 1 began his second year. But for the house of Judah, the house of Judah counted from Tishri 1. And if a king died and a new king took over, and it happened in... October, November, December, it was after Tishri, or it was back in Savan, or whenever. It didn't matter if it was 11 months or one month or whatever. When the house of Judah king was in power, when they got to Tishri 1, all the other time he had spent prior to, whether weeks or whether 11 months or whatever, all of that time for the house of Judah's kings was called a session, which meant it was just part of your setup time. Okay, it would think of Jesus, his first year while John was still there. It was just his getting established time. And when Tishri one came around for that new king, they would now say it is year one. It is year one regardless of how much time that king was in power prior to observing his first year of Tishri. That is the difference between the accession and the non-accession year model. Well, as I have taught many times, Judah are the ones in the land right now. They are the house of Judah. They are not the house of Israel. Right? It is Jews. There's what, 14, 15 million Jews on the earth, not 150 million, not billions, because that's the house of Israel that's mixed in with all the Gentiles now. They don't know where the house of Israel is anymore because it is so diluted within the house of, uh, uh, with the Gentiles. But the Jews, they can. And so from when they came into the land and then got a portion of Jerusalem in late fall of, of 1949. So if we go in late fall and picture this as 1949, they got it sometime like October, November of 1949, which means what? They goes around an entire year all the way back to Tishri 1 that the count officially begins because they are the house of Judah. So when we apply this, it means their first year began in the accession year count of Judah as Tishri 1, 1950, because it was way past already Tishri of 1949 when they got Jerusalem, when they officially were recognized as having this portion of Jerusalem, Tishri 1 had already passed, which means the rest of that year until Tishri 1 was simply the accession year of them since they had Jerusalem. And which means Tishri 1 of 1950, Tishri 1 of 1950 began the year for Jerusalem 
and Jerusalem 70 year count from when they came into the land of Jerusalem, not just into the land of Israel, making the first year in the land 1950 to 1951, Tishri to Tishri, which means even though the trees were planted in 1950 after they had the land from 1949, that would mean in 1951, New Year of Trees, the first year was complete when they what? Were in their first year, you see? 50 to 51, Tishri to Tishri, which means there was New Year of Trees, there was New Year of Trees. Then you have second year, which since they had the portion of Jerusalem, and the second year. So in the midst of it, they had their second New Year of Trees anniversary. Third year with the portion of Jerusalem, in the midst of it was the third year of the New Year of Trees. 1953 to 1954 was the fourth year. And what happens in the fourth year, according to Leviticus 20, uh, 19, 23 through 24? In the fourth year that they had now had Jerusalem and been in the land of Jerusalem, it was the fourth year of the New Year of Trees for Jerusalem, his land in that land that they brought to the Lord. 1953 to 1954, which makes what? The fifth year. Leviticus 19.25, the fifth year. It was now theirs to eat from when they entered the land of Jerusalem and they had that portion of Jerusalem from when they came into the land. That first year, look at this. Lo and behold, it's exactly on a new Shemitah year cycle. 1954 to 1955 was Tishri 1954 to Tishri 1955 was the start of year one to the end of year one. And in that year was the fifth year of trees for which they could eat from it. See? Sabbath, there's the new Shemitah year start. And look what happens if we now follow that 70 years of Jerusalem when they first came into the land, it makes the 70th year Feast of Trumpets 2023 to the Feast of Trumpets 2024. 70th year. Remember? Seven years from what? Feast of Trumpets. Oops. Feast of Trumpets, Feast of Trumpets 2017 to Feast of Trumpets 2018 was the start of the first year to the end of the first year. It began then. It's in perfect alignment with it having started from when they had Jerusalem, first had Jerusalem in an accession year count for the house of Judah who are the ones in the land in alignment with why it said 70 years of Jerusalem from when they came into the land and him being jealous for Jerusalem <clears throat> from when they came into the land in alignment with the final 777 being the warning of Revelation chapter 12 at the Feast of Trumpets in 2017 in 100% alignment, in, I should say, perfect alignment when there was no year zero in a Gregorian calendar year count because that is what all the years have been reconciled into that we live in. Nothing out of place from Christ when he began to be 30, nothing out of place <clears throat> from his birth and the sun, moon, and stars, nothing out of, his, out of place from his death and resurrection from that first year to the one, two, three, and about a half on his own, nothing ends up out of place 
when we account for not Israel in the land, but when they get Jerusalem, which aligns with him saying his land, which aligns with Zechariah 1 saying Judah and how long will, I mean, Jerusalem, how long will you not have uh, um, uh, 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 mercy <clears throat> on the land of Jerusalem itself? Because the angel knows that it is the father's land that they've been defiling since they had it. <clears throat> and when we follow it, we end up just as is revealed in history of when they received it. We follow the Levitical count of when they came into the land. It begins <clears throat> on an actual new Shemitah year count. And guess where it ends? In a Shemitah year count. 2023 to 2024, Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets. Which began the new Shemitah year count at 2017, Feast of Trumpets the Revelation 12 sign. What do we know happens <clears throat> 50 days before the Feast of Trumpets of 2024? The pre-trib of the Bride of Christ at true Feast of Weeks of the winter wheat harvest 50 days before, <coughs> excuse me, 50 days before the end of the year. So what does that do when we go to 2024? <clears throat> Oops, I thought I had it easy. Let's go to 2024. What does that mean? Sticking to the exact same count that we've done this year from Taurus that brings us to the 8th, 9th of Av, that gives us the 50-day count, that brings us to the end of Elul, the 29th of Elul, which is 50 days later. This is the 50th day then anointing of the Holy Ghost, which is that above 14 years, which is that seven years that seemed as days that flew by. When the Acts 2.0 is over, what happens? At true Tishri, having been compassed about for three days, they will be attacked and destroyed. And it begins what? It begins. The 14 years at the Feast of Trumpets 2024 at the Red Horse Rider, which is the destruction of Jerusalem at the Feast of Trumpets seven years from the Revelation 12 sign. Doesn't it make sense now that we consider it? Doesn't it make sense? That the Revelation 12 sign now being as far in as we are, that six years later from the Revelation 12 sign doesn't make it, it doesn't work. It doesn't make sense in the revelation we know from the beginning of creation to the end of, of the thousand year reign that it's 777. Doesn't it make more sense? <clears throat> It absolutely makes more sense. But now what you're about to witness as I bring it to an end, <coughs> excuse me, is one final piece. <coughs> you see, <coughs> excuse me, all of this was directly in line with the 30, when Jesus begins to be 30 or began to be 30. 15th year of Tiberius Caesar's reign. All of these things in order. Do you, do you realize how powerful this is? <clears throat> Excuse me, that none of these things have changed? That, that all of it from his birth to the count to all of it, everything is still in order? <clears throat> all that's happened was a realization that it wasn't Jerusalem it wasn't Israel when they came into the land, but we should have been counting from when they actually had a portion of Jerusalem. And that when we do that, <clears throat> we end up 
with a seven-year start from the Revelation 12 sign with a seven-year ending at the Revelation 12 sign at the beginning of 14 years. Of course, it makes absolute sense <clears throat> that there was a sign that began the 21 years. But I'm about to shock you in a moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, man. That raspy throat from the talking. All right. But you're about to get shocked here a little bit. Because I want you to understand something here with the Jubilee year. I want you to see something. We know the Jubilee year is the end of what? 7777, seven, seven, right? That the final seven is the last of the 49, and then it's the Jubilee year, right? Everybody knows that. But there's always been a debate as to guess guess what? What side it falls on? Is it on the 49 to 50? Or is it on the 50 to 51? <clears throat> That's always been the question. Some think it's it's the it's the final Shemitah year. Others say no, it's the first of the new four of the new seven year Shemitah. Do you realize it's always been a debate? Do you understand how this perfectly ties into one side or the other? Is it a zero side or is it a one side? It's amazing. That's why the, the title was so revealing and so powerful and so fitting for what you're going to see. Because at first, you're going to be scratching your head. But when you see it, you're going to say, oh, no. That's the evidence of it all. Watch this. The Jubilee is the year at the end of seven cycles of Shemitahs, right? Seven, seven Shemitahs. And according to biblical regulations, had a special impact on the ownership of land and so forth. We know that. Rabbinic literature mentions, listen to this, a dispute between sages and Rabbi Yehuda over whether it was the 49th year the last year of the seven Shemitah cycles, referred to as the Sabbath's Sabbath, or whether it was the 50th year. <coughs> we know it's the 50, we know it's the year of release, right? But are you noticing, is it this side? Or is it this side? Is it on the 49 side? Is it on the 50 side? That's really important to understand. I'm going to show you even more here. Check this out. Here it is more. When is the next Jubilee year? Well, we know that they don't understand what we've understood, but the conversation is <clears throat> they don't believe they need to worry about the Jubilee because the other tribes aren't in the land. So they think it's something future and then it will matter. Well, we know that it still has carried on and we know that after the final 14th year, that the true jubilee will take place. And we've spoken on this jubilee in relation to the last video, I guess the second last video of the Noah 2.0. But this is where I was making a comment uh, in the forum to our brother, um, uh, uh, um, Jake, who had sent me an email asking, about how it was kind of looking in relation to what was taking place in the year that the ark, which we know is the final 14th year, was taking place when we had a typology of it being the 600th year as a picture of the 6,000th year. Should it be on the 49th year of things? Or is it on the 50th Jubilee year side of things? Well, it couldn't have been on the Jubilee year side of things because it was the 14th year. <clears throat> and we proved it and we broke it down being the 14th year in what we did in the Acts 2.0, in the Noah 2.0 video. Because in it, it was showing that it was one year 
and 10 days long. The only way you get an event of one year and 10 days is from trumpets to trumpets and 10 days to atonement at the blowing of the trumpet for the Jubilee year, just as it says to do in the Jubilee year. It takes place in the 10th day of that final 49th year. So one year and 10 days only for the 49th year, which means the Jubilee was the following year. Well, we knew that and we broke it down. The only problem was there's a there's wording of year counts in the story of the ark that we have taught on many times. And we know that it can't be the year of Jubilee because it's the year that the Lord corrects and destroys all the enemies that came against Israel and Jerusalem. So <clears throat> look at this. Look at what it says here. Footnotes. This is from Chaba.org. So, and number two, the reasons behind this debate, although there was no biblical requirement to observe the Jubilee year after the 10 tribes were exiled, the observance of the Shemitah sabbatical year remained a biblical obligation. The integrity of the seven-year sabbatical cycle depended on the larger 50-year cycle. After completing seven uh, seven seven-year cycles, a one-year hiatus was taken before the new cycle began. Listen to this. On the 51st year. It was thus necessary to designate a non-observed 50th Jubilee year Others explain that the sages also instituted the partial observance of the laws of Jubilee to commemorate the biblical mitzvah. However, there is also an opinion, uh, an, yeah, an opinion in the Talmud that the Jubilee is not an in-between cycles year, but rather that it is the first of the 40, uh, that it is the first of the next 49-year cycle and thus not designated uh, and thus not designating it would not impact the calculation of the sabbatical Shemitah years. Do you see the confusion? Is it on this side or is it on that side? Well, listen to what we're going to see next. We're going to go back to Jeremiah chapter 25. And I wonder how many of you caught this when I taught on it in the video, <clears throat> in the video, The Grapes of Wrath. It caught my attention, but that was all it did was catch my attention because we were looking at the understanding of 70 ending, 70 ending, and there were 14 years in between. Made complete sense. But, turns out, that is not what the scripture said. You're going to see why I was leading you in the reminding of the 13 years. And the final 14, the 20 years, and then the final 21st being the covenant. There was a reason why I was going into these things so that when we get to here, you won't be confused and saying, wait a second, how come it's not 14 when 70 years is over? Because you're going to see 70 years has to end. And then it's the day of the Lord that is his year. Hello. Remember, he comes feet down on the Mount of Olives from lightning from one end unto the other that the whole world will then see him. 
that happens at the end of 13 or the start of the 14th year at the Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour no one knows from Matthew. So it's over after the 13. The whole world will see him. But all the enemies now are going to want to come against. And what is he going to do? He's going to bring the sword against them. Remember the second sword? And he's going to destroy them all. Does that happen in the 70th year? Or does it happen after the 70 years? Not, let me clarify. Let me clarify. Not the 70 years here, which is when they first came into the land and had a portion of it that gave us the Levitical count. I'm talking about when they captured the rest of Jerusalem. You see, remember, they had agreed to a dividing of Jerusalem so they can get a piece of it. And then in 1967, they captured the rest of Jerusalem. There is no saying, oh, there's a year count from 67 from when they caught it and, and when they got the rest of it and then a one, two, three, four year. No. This is when that happened, when they first received a portion and came into a portion of the land of Jerusalem. 1967 is when they reunited, quote unquote, is when they made Jerusalem no longer divided. I don't know if you're aware of that. But since 1967, Jerusalem is, quote unquote, technically one. I don't know if you know that. You see, that's why the Jews have been building on the other side. <clears throat> that's why they've been screaming in Palestine that they go back to what I was sharing with you earlier to go back to pre-1967 lines. You guys have heard that probably many, many times in your lives that they keep saying we want to go back pre-1967. Why do they want to go back pre-1967? Because in 1967... Israel captured like 5,000 acres and Jerusalem. And they submitted to give back Jerusalem control so that it's being watched over, but they still have access to go into Jerusalem, into the other side. They're still building on the other side. And that's why Palestine is screaming because their portion is getting smaller and smaller and smaller because of where the Jews are building. Because in 1967, they got the rest of Jerusalem. You following? So what ends up happening from this count? Well, this, this is the count that we are now talking about. We're now talking not about the count that begins it all, which is the Zechariah chapter 1 Jerusalem count. We're talking about the Jeremiah 25, 70 years of Jerusalem count. Look what happens. Look what happens when we add or when we remove the year zero. When we remove the year zero, the end of 70 years is the end of the 13th year, leaving one more year, which we know is called what? We know it's called the final day, year of the Lord, which we've read from Isaiah 34, 18, Isaiah 61, 2, which is directly connected to what we shared with Luke 19, uh, 4, 19 and Zechariah 14, 1, when the Lord has returned feet down on the Mount of Olives for the whole world to see at the beginning of the 14th year. But what ends up happening is this is no longer 70. This is the end of 70. Well, do you know what Jeremiah tells us? Do you know what Jeremiah tells us? It's exactly right. Let me show it to you. I told you, when you see this, you're going to say, oh my goodness. Listen to this. 
Jeremiah 25, starting in verse 12. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished. Listen to this. When 70 years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual desolations. Now, does the king of Babylon and the land of the Chaldeans all become perpetual des desolations at the beginning of tribulation? At the end of this 70, at the beginning of tribulation? No, of course not. This is when Babylon is going to have its day. This is when it's going to thrive. It's going to be the time of the end. Let's keep reading. Jeremiah 25, 13. And I will bring upon that land all my words which I have pronounced against it, even all that is written in this book, which Jeremiah hath prophesied against all the nations. For many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of them also. And I will recompense them according to their deeds, according to the works of their hands. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, take the wine cup of, the, of this fury at my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. And they shall drink and be moved and be mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Then took I the cup of the Lord's hand and made all nations to drink unto whom the Lord God hath sent me, to which Jerusalem and the cities of Judah and the kings thereof and the princes thereof to make them a desolation and astonishment and a hissing and a curse as it is this day. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, his servants, princes, and all the mingled people, the king of the land of Uz, uh, of Uz the kings of the land of the Philistines, Ashkelon, uh, Edom, Moab, the children of Ammon, Tyr uh, uh, Tyrus, Zidon, uh, Didon, Timaz, up to, the, and listen to this, verse 23, and all that are in the utmost corners, and all the kings of Arabia, and all the kings of the mingled people that dwell in the desert, and all the kings of Zimri, and all the kings of Elam, and all the kings of the Medes, and all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world, which are upon the face of the earth, and the kings of, Sh uh, of Sheshach shall drink after them. Therefore, thus shall thou say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, drink ye and be drunken, and spew and fall and rise no more because of the sword which I will send among you. And it shall be if they shall refuse to take the cup at thine hand to drink, thou shalt say unto them, thus saith the Lord of hosts, you shall certainly drink. For lo, I begin to bring evil upon the city which is called by my name. And should you be utterly unpunished? You shall not be unpunished, for I will call for a sword upon all the nation, uh, the inhabitants of the earth, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words and say unto them, the Lord shall roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation he shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout, listen to this, and they shall, and they that tread the grapes, hello, against all the inhabitants of the earth, a noise shall come from the ends of the earth, for the Lord has a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord of hosts, behold, behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation 
and a great whirlwind shall rise up from the coasts of the earth, and the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even unto the end of the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. Brothers and sisters, we've covered this before, but there was one important time frame we missed. We know it's the time of the sword. Which sword is this talking about? You guys know it from Luke chapter 22. Remember how we shared there are two swords? Right, this this hilarious verse uh, story where they're saying, he says, you know, how many swords do you have? And they talk amongst themselves, go sell what you got, get a sword. And they talk amongst themselves and they turn around in Luke 22, verse 36 uh, through 38. And in 38, they say, uh, and they said, Lord, behold, there are two swords. So among them all, he says, sell what you got. And they talk amongst themselves, a group of them, and they're like, I got a sword and you got a sword. Well, let's ask them. And they're like, ah, Lord, we've got two. And he's like, all right, that's enough. It's hilarious. But what is it all about? It's the first sword when he comes at the start of the seventh year of seals, which is the, uh, the Ezekiel 39 war. The second sword is the sword that we are talking about right now here. In Jeremiah chapter 25, this sword being spoken about is the second sword. And how do we know? How do we know it's the second sword? Because he is now going to destroy all nations on the face of the earth who are part of this sword destruction that's coming upon all of them who are a part of the treading of the grapes. When is this? When do we read about this? In Revelation, we read about it at the second time the Lord comes, which is, where am I? Is it, oh, sorry, in 19. In Revelation chapter 19, Remember in 17, it says the Lord, right? He's king of kings and lord of lords, but it's all lowercase except one K for king and one L for lord is uppercase. That is the end of the six years of seals at the start of the seventh year of trumpets. Revelation 19 is when he comes as lightning from one end unto the other at the end of the sixth year or 13th year of tribulation, six years of trumpets. It's when he comes at the feast of trumpets in the 14th year starting. When he comes as lightning from one end unto the other, when the whole world will see him in the day and hour, no one knows. Listen to what it says. Starting in verse 15 of Revelation 19. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. That's the second one. That with it, he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God. And he has the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords all upper case <clears throat> brothers and sisters when is this Zechariah chapter 1 is the answer to the when or sorry Zechariah chapter 14 is the answer to the when it is the day of the Lord what is the day of the Lord in Isaiah 32 or is it 34 34, I think, verse 8. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of his recompenses. Remember, this is what we shared about in that previous video. You following? That day of the Lord is a year of his recompenses. When we go to Jeremiah 61, verse 2, it's the same thing. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord 
and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. That final year is the day of the Lord and the year of his vengeance. And we shared how its relation is directly in line with Luke in order, starting with 40 days, just like the story of Noah in that final year begins the 40 days and 40 nights when the year count starts. It says in the second month, 17th day, and when it's over, it's the second month, 27th day. It is a one year and 10 days as the final year of tribulation. But it's not the 70th. It actually is going to take place after the 70 years are done. And you see, look at, look at what it said. Remember in Luke 4, 19, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. Why did this matter? Because he had already returned feet down. It was already the day of the Lord. He's now proclaiming the year. He's saying it's been fulfilled prophetically in the end of days. It's going to happen in the is to come <clears throat> when he will be seen in his day. Like Luke 17 says, when he will be seen as lightning from one end to the other in his day, which is the day of the Lord, which will be the acceptable year when all these things will then take place, which is the story of Noah, which is why Matthew 24 after it talks about him coming as lightning from one end unto the other, it would be the day and hour no one knows at the Feast of Trumpets to start that 14th year, like Zechariah chapter 14, when he returns feet down on the, on the Mount of Olives, it will be as it was in the days of Noah, and it is that one year trumpets to trumpets, and then that final 10 days, which will be the proclamation of the final jubilee. But I don't want you to miss the point I was making in Jeremiah 25. This, I wanted to do two points. One is to show you clearly that Jeremiah 25 is talking about the final 14th year when he brings about the destruction upon them. When they are drunken and it's the wine press of the wrath of the Lord when it's going to be against all the nations from one end unto the other. We've already spoken about this before. We know it. We've understood it. But did you catch it? Jeremiah 25, 12. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished. Ding, ding, ding. Ding, 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 sound the alarm. Ring the bell, brothers and sisters. You want to know what that means? When 70 years are accomplished, look at our previous chart. 14 years, the 70th year wouldn't have been accomplished until the 14th year was over. That would mean that this year right here that would mean the Jubilee, the 15th year, would have been the day of the Lord when he brings all of this devastation and destruction against all the enemies of the earth. Have you ever heard of a Jubilee year for the Lord being the year when he destroys all the enemies? Never. This final Jubilee year is the year of restoration when they will all be brought back, like, like Ezekiel says in the end of 47 into chapter 48, that is the final Jubilee year. Well, according to Jeremiah, it's the destruction by the Lord is going to happen after 70 years are completed. Do you see how wrong this was? But it was impossible to understand because, one, we had a year zero in a Gregorian year where there should be no year zero. And we were running this count off of the house of Israel instead of Jerusalem. 
And we could not then reconcile how after 70 years, being after 14 years, would be the Lord's final year destruction. It made no sense. Do you want to see what it is now? Have a look at that. There's your 70 year for Jerusalem when they had a peace. It's the Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets, which began at the Feast of Trumpets 2017 at the sign that was to prepare us all, which brings us to the end of 70 years being accomplished. The end of 13 years. The end of the 13 years, seven of seals, seven of trumpets, or seven easy, seven of seals, six of trumpets for the 20 years bigger picture, completes it at the end of 13 years, which is the end of 70. Which means the accomplishing of 70 years in the proper count without a zero, but starting at year one in a Gregorian calendar year, leaves us with what? The devastation of Jeremiah 25 that the Lord said he would bring upon all of the nations when he brings his final sword as the treading of the grapes when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives, like Jeremiah, uh, Zechariah 14, like Revelation chapter 19, when he will then return after 70 years has been accomplished in Jerusalem, he will return feet down on the, on the, on the Mount of Olives and will destroy all the enemies that have come against them in the final day of the Lord as his year of recompense. Brothers and sisters, there you have it. When 70 years are accomplished, it will be the final 14th year of his recompense. And this final 14th year, this final Shemitah year, is the year of Matthew 24, the story of the ark, which said, what? Zechariah, uh, sorry, Jeremiah, uh, sorry, Genesis, starting 11.7, in the 600th year of Noah's life. It began, right? Second month, 17th day. In the 600th year, do you remember the typology we said? The 600th is like saying the, the 6,000th. Where do you think the count begins? Hello. Where do you think his count begins? Remember 600th year or 6,000th year? When does it begin? It begins when the 49 is done, right? When 49 and then day one, people still would call it the 49th. You see? That's where it's actually taking place. It's not the Jubilee year. Look at what it says when it's all done. It's the 600th year, first year, first month, first day. Which means it was one year. And then you had what? And in the second month, 27th day, so you have a one year and 10 day count. And it completes the final 14th year. You realize it cannot be the Jubilee year? Because why? Because it's the devastation that the Lord brings with the second sword. That second sword, that final days of Noah from Matthew 24 is the year of the Lord and the day of his, and the year of his recompense. It cannot be the Jubilee year, of course, but it can also not be during the 70th year because the Lord said he was going to bring it after 70 years were accomplished. He would fulfill that final year. The year of Noah 
is this final year right here when the 70 years are complete. And it is perfectly in line with Isaiah 34, 61, Luke 4, Zechariah 14. I should probably even put Jeremiah like this one right here. It's, it's the completion of the 70 years that Jeremiah said. Then the year of the Lord and the grapes of his treading wrath. When that final year is over, it will then be the final jubilee. And look at these Shemitah years, guys. Do you notice something? This was never changed. Do you know why it's never changed? Because I can't change seven-year cycles. We know the final seven and seven and the seven before it. All we have to keep doing is going seven, 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 seven. There's no way to, to mismanage it. All you got to do is be able to add. And when we did with the accounting of the difference of the year zero, when it should have been one in a Gregorian calendar, everything dropped one year. And when it did, I instantly knew it instantly, instantly, this is where it started for me. It instantly came to me, Jeremiah 25. I knew it because when I had read it, I knew it had told us that it was after 70 years were accomplished. And there was no way I could reconcile that if the 14th year was fulfilled as the 70th year. I hope this really sinks in. Take your time. Study it again. Watch it again. I will um, end up putting this one. I will put this one into, so you guys can see it, all right? I will put this Shemitah year chart into the description box under the video. It will get added to the website. But my goodness, brothers and sisters, now does it make sense? Now, is it making sense? Now, is it making sense? Now is the 13 or big picture 20 making the covenant and then the final year. Now, is it making sense? My goodness. The, the, the news that is uh, unfortunate, that is not exciting for us is of course the fact that it means we've got one more year and I'm sorry to be the bearer of that news it doesn't mean we don't watch these upcoming events just in case and because it doesn't change the fact that we are watching always anyways are we not a declaration here of those who are as Enoch was? We absolutely are unequivocally watching and praying that we may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. We will continue to do what watchmen do. We will continue to do what the diligent do in seeking our Lord and Savior in his word. We will remain diligent until. But we will now be able to do it. With more air, more breath in our lungs, more strength in our minds and in our spirits to go out and do these things that need to get done, to go out and share and spread the word more without always being on edge 
feeling you have to tell somebody, get ready, the day is at hand, the day is at hand, the Lord's coming, the Lord's coming. I can understand at this date, this date, that date. Set that aside and just share them now. Share the revelation in letting them know that you know the time is near at hand. Because it is. Brothers and sisters, I love you. I pray for you. We, I will continue to fight in this and seek and diligently share with you as it continues to be revealed and as it continues and continues, I will continue and continue. I have made that promise to you. I have made that promise to the Lord. I ask that you please continue with me. Continue to pray over us and over each other. Continue to support the ministry here and abroad so that we can continue to do so. And brothers and sisters, we will see each other soon enough. We will see each other. And it will be in his presence, either in the third heaven, in the lowest room, or standing here girded about when he returns from the wedding. It may be longer than we had hoped, but it will be right on time. Brothers and sisters, I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. Talk to you soon. Bye for now.